Trustees Select Board meeting for January 10th, 2022. First order of business is to approve the agenda unless there are any changes. I make a motion to approve the agenda as written. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Any, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, all right, moving on to consent agenda items. Minutes from January 3rd meeting and the certificate of highway mileage year ending February 10th, 2022. I'll move to approve the consent agenda as. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Can you pass this around for signature? Uh, moving on to public, it's an opportunity for anyone from the public to speak on any item that's not currently on the agenda, um, but we will give anyone an opportunity to speak on any agenda item. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak today? Anyone online? Uh, Alright, we will move on. Uh, starting with the Vitalizing Waterbury. Be signed. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, um, there's this little owl thing for anyone who's online, so if you just speak loudly and then it should <coughs> rotate the camera to you. Uh, um, hi. Good, evening. Good to see everybody. Did everyone get a copy of the document I passed out? Does anyone want a hard copy version of it? Yeah. Oh, you got it all? I just want to make sure. Anyone back there want a copy? Sure. Yes, there's the uh, highway. Yeah. So, um, 2022 has arrived, and uh, Revitalize in Waterbury is um, uh, doing well. We came out of the pandemic um, with some strength, uh, considering. Um, this, you know, what the world was doing, but part of that was the uh, support this, um, this town has continues to give Revitalizing Waterbury. Um, we greatly appreciate um, everything you've done for us. And it's, um, and we're really excited about the new year and what we have going on. So um, I presented this, this request is different than it has been in the past. I gave you a little more data. Uh, one of the things we've really been working hard on over the last couple of years and are really proud of is how we've really diversified where our funding comes from. One of the reasons we made it through the pandemic was that when one funding stream, particularly business memberships, just dropped off the face of the earth, there was other ways to receive funding and ways to um, support the organization. Um, at no point did we let in a, we did not leave, let any employees go because it was really important to be here to support our businesses in the community. So um, the first page shows you sort of our revenue streams for the first 11 months of the year. December just finished, I don't have the end of the year numbers yet. But you can see that um, the town of Waterbury is about 20, a little over 20% of our funding in 2021. And this coming year, we're asking for some increases. We're asking for some additional help. Um, our role in the community has been changing and um, we, we are a volunteer-led organization. There's three staff, a board, but a board of directors and everything else is by volunteers. And um, we can't do it all the way we used to do it, I would say. I uh, specifically have identified three areas. Economic development, this has been an area you've supported us um, since the uh, uh, year was it? I don't even remember if I've written it in here. Must have been shortly after the flood. Right after the flood, yes. Um, Zoe uh, Gordon was the first uh, economic development director. Alyssa Johnson, 
um, was the second one. Mark Pamilia, we hired back in March 2021. He's doing a phenomenal job. We have uh, worked hard to not ask for too much money for that position, but we are asking for a 3% increase in your, our funding from last year to this year um, for uh, economic development services. But more particularly, the where we've actually decided to ask for a little more help is in um, what would be couched as general operations, but it's not. There's beautification and marketing and promotion. The two of the other pillars of the work that we do for um, the town of Waterbury. Uh, beautification is, has been something we've done for a long time. We used to do little Christmas trees, flowers and planters and all of these projects. And then we do holiday decor. And it has become um, unsafe for volunteers to do a lot of this work anymore. We can put plants in the ground, but getting people up on ladders and hanging things off of lamp posts and buildings has um, just Steve Lotch Beach hanging off of a ladder makes me anxious every single time I see it. And we've been, and our, our, um, our volunteers, by the way, you probably haven't noticed, but a lot of volunteers are sort of in the older generation, and I don't want them on ladders either. And they're not as, as nimble as they could be. So Steve Lodgebeach and I talked about this, and the design committee has talked about this, and we have talked to Mike Lociavo and asked and, and got, a, uh, got some quotes from him to hire him to do some of this more climbing up and down ladders, hiring people to do the work that our volunteers have done in the past. By the way, Montpelier hires, Shell, uh, Montpelier hires, Stowe hires, Middlebury hires, most towns of, significant, of size, similar size, hire companies or people and buildings to, um, companies to do this work for us. So I'm asking for $9,600 um, that will help <coughs> hire this person to help do the work. The design committee will organize it, will plan it, will manage it. We will plant the flowers. Um, but someone else is going to climb those ladders. Uh, it's a liability <coughs> crisis waiting to happen. Um, and I've really said recommend that our W design committee manages all the major beautification efforts for the town of Waterbury. They, we really do a lot of this work. Um, we partner with uh, Artie, River Runs Through It, in some of our work. So I'm really looking at uh, uh, sort of formalizing and really <coughs> making this happen. In the past, there have been bits and pieces of funding for beautification, but it was always like, sponsor a barrel. We don't have barrels anymore. Sponsor a tree, but we don't have trees anymore. And just the little bits and pieces of taking in 20 bucks to pay for a tree and come up with the funding, this seems to me is the most reasonable um, solution for beautification. The other request is around marketing and promotion. We receive $1,000 a month from you for general operations, and then $5,000 for the branding and marketing support. That is the amount that we began receiving in two, I've got these numbers here, eight, nine years ago for the first time. We've never asked for a request in these funds. What's changed is after, through Main Street, we have really taken on a complete plan for marketing this town as a destination to support our businesses. And we've developed programs We've developed strategies. We've developed partnerships, including the one with Route 100, Best of Route 100, Stowe Area Association in the Mad River Valley. Mm -hmm. We have worked really hard. This is becoming, I don't want to call it organic, but it's become a brand. Waterbury is a place to come to and to be. And by bringing and pulling these people together to come here and marketing and promoting our town, we are supporting our businesses, which create a lively, 
um, engaging and fun community for all the residents and makes it a um, economically sound place to live and do business. So we have asked for an increase of um, $6,000. So of, of, um, basically it's going from $1,000 a month to $1,500 a month for our general operating dollars on top of the other bits and pieces. Um, this year, we're undergoing some major projects. Stowe Street Alley is moving forward. Please to report we've raised $40,000 for this project already. We have written some grants. They are, we're going to be kicking off this project soon. We got our, our, um, we got our uh, zoning permits almost complete. We have to go back with a few design things. Uh, very excited. I plan on working with Bill and um, Steve to submit a new downtown transportation grant for the town of Waterbury. State of Vermont has changed its funding formula, doubled, <coughs> tripled the amount of money available to downtowns to $200,000 grants for a 25% match. That's only $50,000. We have paid off all of our downtown transportation grants. We've completed them through Main Street. We can be really um, strategic to create a good project for the town. It would be really unfortunate if we didn't submit some funding for some funding with the downtown transportation grant. And uh, we're also partnering with some of the other arts organizations to create a public art master plan, which will bring to the select board to consider adopting in some fashion as we find that public art has really been uh, something this community loves to do. So I'm just sort of popping things out here. Do you have questions for me? I have one. Mm -hmm. um, so the downtown transportation mm -hmm. that you were just talking about, so I just heard late in the year that that increase was coming. You talked to me yeah. when I visited your office several weeks ago. Um, and it's just kind of through the end of the year and through this process, it's hard to find the time to figure out what we're going to do. So is it, um, I guess what I'm asking, and you don't have to have an answer for tonight, but before the budget, process ends. I think we don't necessarily have to identify what we're going to do uh, for a downtown grant, but if there's any kind of match involved from the municipality, I need you to help me figure out how much money we need to include in some line item. And it doesn't have to be a specific line item, but we can work together. I, I just, um, you know, I don't have well, the timing is really hard. I so respect that, Bill. And the thing is, is this is sort of a one-shot deal. This is the state using the ARPA money and getting it out there. And if we don't take it advantage of it, we're may, you know, we may not get another chance for this kind of money at this kind of match. Right. And um, and the grants are due in March. So, the queen of the downtown transportation grant program was Barb Barr. So, she's gone, but I can call her if I have to. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to put a plug in for, this is, a, Karen's not going to be surprised to hear me say this, but um, we really need to uh, update the lighting at Rusty Parker Park. The, you know, I don't think anybody who's visited the park hasn't noticed the poles starting to, uh, they've gone past their useful life, let's just put it that way. Um, and they're pretty pricey to replace from what we understand and to replace them with what's comparable or similar to what is on the uh, streetscape. So that that would be something that I would strongly yeah, that's, that's a good idea. advocate yeah. for. Yeah. So I will be a good um, ARPA project. Hmm? That'd be a good ARPA project. This is a per it's a perfect type of project. And the other um, I'm, I'm in the back of my mind, I'm even wondering, could we use parts of the Stowe Street Alley project and get some money through the downtown transportation grant, like, like the lighting for this, the alley? So here's the deal. 
I'm going to reach out to you, Bill, and maybe Steve. Together, we can sit down and have a quick brainstorm, or I'll just do it with Steve, and then we'll come up with some numbers and give you a match. Right. But I think the minimum match is, I mean, the maximum match is 25%, which is going to be $50,000. And But if we don't submit for a full $200,000 project, or $250,000 if it's a match, we can come up with numbers. I got, I got this one. All right. <laughs> that, that sounds close to volunteering to, uh, write, the to grant? write the grant to me. But, uh, yeah, it'll be a team effort. It'll be a team effort. The max grant on that was 250000 Yeah, it would be 200000 from them, 50000 right. for the match. Yeah. So the project would have to be about 250000 And this additional 6000 <clears throat> as part of the economic development services, that helps create that match. Okay. No, no. The six thousand I'm asking for, which is part of general operations, this is just supporting revitalizing Waterbury and all the work we do. For example, partnering with the town and writing a downtown transportation grant. Um, that takes time and effort and um, a lot of work. Um, so that's that's what that is for. That is to go towards supporting revitalizing Waterbury. And honestly, that six thousand will help us market this town. Our goal with the additional funding for general operations is to use that for promoting this community in this town. We do that through our website, social media, advertising, partnerships, and a variety of other ways. So maybe I'm misunderstanding the conversation. So where would that match come from? Is that an additional ask that would happen later? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. That was a... That would be in the CIP. Okay. Um, can, can I mention something about, sure. about the ask? I, uh, not about the 50000 um, This is back to the RW budget. That was separate from the RW budget, that, that whole grant thing. Mm -hmm. um, as, as people might be aware, um, the uh, Library Tourism Council was subsumed under revitalizing Waterbury. The activities of that and the Tourism Council went away because we wanted to reduce duplication in the community. And uh, we were very fortunate when we started the Main Street project to be able to hire a, hire a um, outstanding marketing associate, um, Ariel Monblack. And as a board, we made the decision because of the success that we have seen with attracting visitors to Waterbury and supporting businesses through that marketing, we made the decision to keep that position on as a permanent on a permanent basis. So we uh, um, the board of RW really felt like marketing this community is something that is critical to the ongoing success of our businesses and our community at large. And we took the risk, if you will, of, of doing that um, and uh, now have a 35 hour a week position um doing that on an ongoing basis and um we essentially right now are in the position of having to raise funds in order to maintain that position and um part of what that is about is well all of what it's about is marketing the community of waterbury and um so just wanted to, to mention sort of the history of where we got to and where we are at at this place. And so the general support of RW has remained at $12,000 since the town, well, we've been an organization 28 years, and so it's been uh, about 25 years of the same. Well, no, so we're, we're only like about 10 years, 10, 11 years, so. Oh, since the, I'm not at the thousand dollars money going back. I'm not talking about the 5,000 for brand. No, no, designated downtown has only been about 10 or 11 years. Oh, okay. That's when you started funding us, when we became a designated downtown. Downtown. So it's been the same amount for all that, that time, except for the branding, when we decided to, <laughs> to uh, ensure that we had the branding. So um, we really are, are hopeful that um, you see the value of our marketing efforts, of marketing the community uh, as a long-term strategic way to uh, increase tourism in the community and to support the downtown. Yes. Uh, Katia, I'm the, um, Katia D'Angelo, I'm the uh, vice chair of the Red Lake Monterey, and I second all of that, obviously. 
Um, but I'd also like to, uh, you know, Teresa spoke a lot about marketing outwardly, but REL in that position and the need to also market inwardly and support the projects that we do. She does a lot for the Arts Fest, the Wrap It Up and Win, which are all you know, great benefits to residents here in town, um, along with everything else. But so I just wanted to get that. Because RW is about, you know, promoting for residents, businesses, and visitors, all three together. Mm -hmm. And Ariel's on in case you have any questions. Yeah. If you want to ask her any questions, yeah. she's there. She's on if you want. So I uh, continue on with a couple of questions mm -hmm. here. Um, I see last year you had 48,000 uh, 48, in, in uh, <coughs> PPP loans. Obviously, that's yep. gone. Correct. Uh, so a lot of times what happens is people will adjust their programs to meet the funding that they have and now that that funding is gone did you have to chop up that number and put it into the rest of these line items for 2022 somehow and, and maybe take a loss as well or is it completely gone from the it's completely gone um we the ppp loans backstopped us when we had almost no business memberships um, or individual membership money coming in. So what you don't see is sort of 2020, year, 2020 was the difficult year. The PPP loans all sort of were forgiven in 2021, but they arrived and helped pay and support us um, through 2020 and into 2021. So the, um, it's a good question. We, we had many board meetings where we talked about spending a year on subsidies. And that's what those were, those were subsidies. And we were very, very cognizant of that. And again, that's why the diversity of our revenue streams are so important. And if you look at one of the budget items this coming year is corporate payments are significantly higher than they were in the past. It's because we have a couple projects that are going to bring in funding for us. Um, we And so that's one of the resources. And the, can you explain that a little bit? How does that work and what, what is like an example of a project? So, Discover Waterbury Guide. We are reprinting the Discover Waterbury Guide. This is marketing. This is how we promote our town. I don't <coughs> have a copy of the guide here, though I swear there's probably one in this building somewhere. Nine by three and a half. Oh, Ariel's showing you a picture of it on the screen. So, um, we last printed it in 2019. These are, print, we print 25,000 copies. And their um, opportunity for small businesses in town to advertise. Plus, we have a lot of um, storytelling in there for ideas of where to go. They are put in um, the info centers up and down the interstate. They are distributed uh, at other locations. People and businesses have them. You know, when you go visit a town, you know, visit a new community or someplace on vacation. Everyone says print is dead, but people pick these up. This is the, the one thing they pick up, and we go through them printing those. We've got advertising, um, and we've done all the pricing, and um, we will make money on the Discover Waterway Guide. That is one of the things we do. Um, and it's every other year, but this is the year we will be printing it, so that will be <coughs> our funding um, sources. So honestly, you see that in 2021, it was 34000 20. 22, 71,000, the corporate, it's about 30 to $35,000 that we will bring in. Now there's expenses that go against that, but um, that's why, the, that's the difference. That's the funding that comes in for that project. How did you make such a huge leap on your foundation? That is Stowe Street Alley. <laughs> I am planning on bringing in at least $50,000 and whether it's foundation money or corporate, it's gonna come in, I'm not sure where, but I put it in foundations because we are gonna apply for some significant grants. We will start knowing about those grants in February. And if they do, they will be, um, they will come in as um, foundation money. And you said you already raised 40,000. 40, 40, we 39,000 and 50 bucks, so it's pretty close. Unless someone wants to give me a thousand bucks and I'll get 30. <laughs> um, I have a few questions. Mm -hmm. One, I guess, in terms of uh, where you have both revenue streams for the train station mm -hmm. in both ends, 
wouldn't you have been down because you lost the coffee shop? Mm -hmm. No? There's a wonderful little thing called a lease. <laughs> so they're still paying. They are paying me on a monthly basis. They can, the lease still they runs. They couldn't break it or anything like that. Oh, we wouldn't let them. <laughs> uh, I know. Corporations have a way of doing that. No. It, there's no out clause. I mean, there's, people, yeah. the people who negotiated that lease, that 20 year lease, I mean, one, it's not often you have a 20 year lease for a okay. space like that. That explains that. And there, yeah. was, there literally was no out. It was one of the first things we looked at when uh, they notified us that they were not coming back. Okay. So no out clause. What is the expiration of that lease? Um, August 2026. So if you get another tenant, say, this year or the year after, does that then do you, do you double up? No, what we do is okay. we negotiate with KBP a buyout, a buyout that will make us whole based right. on the current rent and the old rent. So um, I am pleased to inform you that on Friday we signed a letter of intent with a potential client uh, tenant. I know I've been hearing, you know, rumors. Of well, you can hear all the rumors you want. I'm not going to say anything more. <laughs> okay. than that's, that's all I need to know. the letter of intent. <laughs> um, but uh, I will tell you that Teresa and I were pretty much dancing for joy on Friday um, to know that this, it was about a year ago when we were informed that they were going to not come back. So yeah. it's, been, it's not been easy. But yep. we're excited about it. The other question is, I, you know, the money for the design committee. I know it's difficult to get volunteers. I know people like me with broken bodies are still climbing up ladders, and we still will do that. But is this contract with Lo Chiavo, is, is it total service? Like the people who, some people like to volunteer. Oh, no, we're not losing our volunteers because okay. my volunteers are really important to us. They will. All I will have is volunteers who will be doing organization and know exactly what's going on and bringing things out, but they're not going to climb the ladders. They won't be climbing up the ladders. And then when something is broken or has to be fixed, Mike will go and take care of it instead of Steve during lunch hour rushing down the street with a ladder and climbing up and trying to put something on. We will have someone who takes care of it for us. Okay. So, yes, we will. The, and there's, I assume he's going to do like watering too, right? Yes. So when it comes to the Full summertime, service kind of contract. Right. Flowers, hanging the flower baskets. He's got a team. He's so when it came to hanging the garlands, he volunteered for a big chunk of time to come out and experience what it means to hang the garlands and saw the process and understood it. And then with that information, he went back and he quoted us a price of what it would take for his team to hang the garlands. And then um, you know, and then the flower baskets he helped put, I think he helped take the flower baskets down. This contract will start in February when we will actually bring the garlands down before springtime. This is a new project, a new way of doing things for us. Um, so we're really pleased. Uh, he knows this town, he knows, uh, knows the projects. So uh, mm -hmm. very, very pleased. And that $9,600 also represents costs of buying flowers and costs of buying supplies and things like that. So it's not purely a Mike Glociavo contract price. Now, the last question is, mm -hmm. I know on the money for the support of marketing and promotion, mm -hmm. that's up quite a bit. Um, is is there any other large ticket item other than you put in the second paragraph? Or is it just small, you know, marketing tax? So the marketing is really going from 5000 to about $11,000 plus the 12000 right. that supports the general operations of us. Um, major projects. Revitalizing Waterbury is undertaking a massive strategic planning process that doesn't cost money, but it takes time. We are in Stow Street Alley, which is a huge, right. a huge project. project. The master plan for public arts um, for the project. town is a very big project. Not doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money, but it's time consuming. Right. Waterbury Arts Fest has some significant changes that will happen this year, so that is going to require a fair amount of marketing and promotion to make that happen. Um, and um, but. We plan on taking it up a notch, and that will be a pretty uh, <coughs> major project. Everything takes place in the next six months, and then I don't know what's going to hit. So, <laughs> we'll okay. see what else comes along. So these things you think are going to be ongoing projects? So there's going to be an ongoing yes. a revenue stream yes. and income stream necessary for that. Yes. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks.
So, Mark, I don't want to forget everybody up on the screen. Danny. Oh, Danny. Yeah, Danny. Danny, go ahead. I'm just curious if there is an accessible um, annual, annual report for either 2020 or 2021. I was only able to find 2019 online. Oh. I'd love to be able to find that. Well, you should. So, 2020. Two, 2021 is being approved by the board of directors tomorrow at our board meeting and then I will send it out to you. Um, and then the 2021 should be online. Ariel, you're right there. Can you find the link and put it in the chat? She's got it. Thank you. <laughs> it's in the town report. It's in last year's it's a, Yeah, it's always it's in, in the town report. report. Yeah. So, but I also put it, go ahead, Ariel. All right. Uh, I don't see a chat available to me. Um, if you go to revitalizingwaterbury.org slash about dash us, um, it does have the 2020 annual report linked from there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Aria. Danny, any other questions? No, thank you. Um, how has business and individual membership what totals for 2022 budget compared to like 2019 prior to pandemic is this a return to those numbers or is this it's an increase it's an increase we um will say that um main street in the pandemic has risen rw's profile in the town of waterbury and um particularly with individuals and we did if you are a homeowner in this town you received a mailing from us in december it's the first time we've ever done a mailing to every home is basically the grand list um, it was sort of a shot in the dark but we feel that we it was time to make sure everybody knew who we were instead of just constantly asking money from the people we know um, and that has been highly successful and uh, gosh I have to do this analysis for the board meeting tomorrow night but I think we've already brought in fifteen thousand dollars from individual donations including a number of um, significant donations from people we've just never met before. So that was. Are those considered memberships or is that Father Foundation? It's called those, it says individual membership. That's their individual memberships. Foundations, money, um, you know, you get fidelity, charitable trust donations, but I consider them their, their personal annual campaign donations. Um, and business memberships, we've done a couple of strategies. Uh, last year, because of the pandemic, we gave a 50% discount on memberships um, and that was actually supported by the PPP loan money sort of backstopped it in some ways um, and we increased our number of member uh, business members from about 80 to 110 uh, with that and this year we are giving a 25 percent discount on memberships up until January 31st and it's a f an effective tool of people actually we make more money when we cut the price a little bit because <laughs> people are willing to come on but I think the work we're doing is becoming is really being recognized anecdotally um, one of the board members works in a store in Stowe and spent Saturday helping people and whenever she talked to someone from Waterbury she mentioned revitalizing Waterbury she said every single person in the store that she spoke to had heard of RW and knew what we were doing we haven't had that kind of community recognition in a long time. So. And I will say it has a lot to do with your support of our organization. <clears throat> We're here doing the work that, as I say, you don't want to do. <laughs> well, also, thank you for everything that you did with regard to the three year Main Street Transportation Project. I know that. We had grant money that we were able to, you know, pay the bills that you sent us yes. every month. Uh, we were happy to have grant support for it, but even if the grant hadn't covered it all, it was, and we would have had to pay, it was worth every penny of what you did for it. So thank you. That's personally for me, because Barb uh, worked very closely with you and your staff to make sure that that all was handled seamlessly. So thank you very much. Well, and the other thing, thank you very much for, for that. I appreciate it. Well, the other thing is that we've also put into place systems that if we ever have a major project like that, again, we've got websites and, app, you know, we've just got systems in place for all of that. Um, I will also um, share, just thinking about this, um, this past year we um, took advantage of a, uh, 
a retail market study and a housing study uh, for the town of Waterbury through the economic development. And um, those studies are coming in. Housing study draft is here. Economic, uh, the marketing, retail marketing study should be here by the end of the week. We plan on sharing this all with you. The housing study is eye-opening, really actionable things that we can get to work on, and we want, we'll make sure you see all of that. I think the most amazing number I read from that was the average price of a home in Waterbury between 2019 and 2021 raised, went up by $98,000. I think we all knew it, but it's there. Well, I was talking to Dan Sweet today. Um, we have to reappraise by state law if we hit 85% uh, kind of level of appraisal. We're a little bit higher than 86% now. We had been, our CLA had been dropping about 2% a year every year, um, but the last year it dropped over 5%. So we went from like 91 CLA a year ago to 86. So that is what you are talking about. Yeah. So, but we will share those studies as soon as we have them, I promise. I would expect by the end of January we'll have those copies for you. Yeah, but this, so this conversation kind of segues into my last couple of comments mm -hmm. and perhaps a question. Um, first, I want to thank you for coming forward with this information. I know it's always difficult to come to ask for more money. Mm -hmm. You guys have been incredibly responsible over the years. Um, it's even harder as a board member to think about having to ask the taxpayers to reach a little deeper um, to, to you know, make these things happen. Um, my concern is, and that always is, you know, um, devil's advocate, whatever you want to call me. Uh, there's some other things that you know, the board members here are aware of, mm -hmm. I don't know if they're thinking about them, but, uh, you know, that are going to end up increasing, I think, perhaps our budget again. Uh, of course, we're not finalized with it, so we don't know the end result. Uh, some additional costs may come about um, that could impact the tax rate as well. Uh, and we have some solutions, perhaps, at least to help mitigate it. Um, you know, back after the flood, um, economic development, development economic development's position um, was created and there was plenty of times we discussed that maybe someday that position would go away but it almost seeming like it's inevitable that it stayed here. Um, I kind of wondered if the, we would ever take the training wheels off the bike and allow the town to run on its own but uh, I'm not sure that that could ever happen. Um, so I'm starting to question, and I thought I would never say this, um, whether or not, and, I, and I'm not sure that it takes a charter to create that, but a uh, um, um, local options tax. Um, I was always, I was always reluctant to consider that because I'm a huge proponent of self-employed business people, but. I stopped in the local place here today, picked something up, and I was talking to the young guy behind the counter. And during this conversation, he said to me, we were talking about wages and you know employment and whatnot. He said, I'm struggling to pay my rent on 17 bucks an hour. So I can guarantee you that his rent is first and foremost in his life. And it's 17 bucks an hour, how much is that leaving him for the rest of the necessities of life? Mm -hmm. It's those kinds of things that make me, you know, when I'm, when I'm sitting here at this table, I tend to push back on, on new asks for money because it's impacting all those people that are having such a tough time. And uh, so, I, you know, I try to talk openly about other ways to mitigate it, other ways to come up with revenue sources. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, moving 
forward. Uh, the housing, the whole I'm very interested in the housing issue. Um, costs are just mm -hmm. skyrocketing, and, and I just I can't even imagine what people would have to fork out of their pocket to try to, even if they could. Yeah. You know, this this gentleman here at 17 bucks an hour, no way, no way. I would love to say a couple things. One, local options tax. There's a variety of different tools, TIF districts, downtown investment districts that are people that are different communities like ours use to help support the kind of work we do. Um, I always. Uh, have to remind myself that Montpelier receives $100,000 a year from their downtown investment district in order to market and promote their and do their work. So it's like, I had that, I wouldn't be standing here. <laughs> um, so that's just, there's a lot of how variety of ways. How does that funding mechanism work? Is it through property tax? Or it I honestly don't know. I don't know the details, but I do know um, that's what Montpelier has. Um, again, that is a downtown investment district, so it has to be spent on the downtown. And we have, we've moved beyond that um, of being specifically downtown to the entire town of Waterbury. It's very much a focus of ours. Yeah, that's how the TIF districts work, too. Yeah. That, you know, for improvements, uh, it's supposed to happen within the district. And right. it's, it's challenging. We talked about a TIF district here uh, way back when Sue Minter was still in the legislature. So that was what before 2010, and we always had an issue then. Well, well we've got a town and a village who gets the money, right. you know, and and the Main Street project would have been an ideal candidate for a district in terms of a 20, 21 billion dollar investment, and then using revenues from additional uh, grand list that was built in the mm -hmm. downtown to pay for it, but. We only had to pay two four hundred thousand dollars <laughs> worth of that twenty one million. So yeah. I, I don't think a TIF district is anything that we should be considering right now. The local option tax, there's pros and cons to that. Um, you know, I kind of mentioned a couple of weeks ago uh, that I think that you ought to seriously consider uh, you know merging completely with EFLUD now. They got rid of their village that was a, from my point of view, transition um, and, and you know, take the opportunity to write a charter for the community and then you can talk about all those issues. There's a lot of things going on in the state house now. There are advocates for local option taxes there. There are other legislators who are saying we shouldn't have local option taxes at all. They're talking about uh, uh, creating some kind of general revenue sharing for towns now. There's a lot of moving parts at the moment, and I think all that stuff is not something for tonight. We right. have to do the funding for our ability. We've got two other organizations. Yeah. We're already 45 minutes <laughs> behind. Well, not 45 Sorry. Minutes. No, it's not a big problem. Well, I would, uh, the, the other thing I'd say, Chris, is that um, we have been very responsible with the town's money. We are very, very careful. We pay a lot of attention. and. We don't often ask for increases, and um, and so we're asking. And, and you can make whatever decision you make based on that, but we feel that the amount of funding you give us is used exponentially to benefit this town. So just the idea of having staff who are here to answer questions of businesses and talk to the residents and um, all that kind of stuff. Well, so that's all I'm, that's where I'm coming from. You know what my job is. My job is to ask. And, and Your job is to figure it out from there. <laughs> and, and to Chris's point, all of these asks are incremental. And they, all, yeah. they all add up. The economic development director, you know, it's $54,000. So it's about five-eighths of a penny on the tax rate for that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but I'm pretty sure that uh, the, I don't think, I think this is out there news now, if it's not, you can hit me later, but uh, two veggie grants, right? Yes, for, the two for, veggie for, grants. This for, is, for, this is, uh, what's uh, IV Computing. IV Computers uh, and MTX. And then MTX. MTX. So we had talked about the MTX one a couple of months ago. Uh, based on that information that we had, I heard from
from, from Mark about uh, ID computers and what they were hoping to do. So I basically wrote another letter of support under my name saying, hey, the select board supported this FTX thing a few months ago. Please support this. And so those two veggie grants, uh, somebody's going to be coming into where um, Carl Seuss was yeah. up in the Library Center with up to what, 250 jobs? Yeah, something like that. 100 plus to start and 250 ultimately. And then IV Computer is going to be coming, or they're already there, but they're going to be able to grow much more exponentially and quickly as opposed to just organically over time. So yeah. having that economic development director, I think I mean, those two things right there uh, pays for the economic development yes. director, I think, for probably five years anyway. Veggie grants are rare, and two of them happened in the town of Waterbury in one year. And Ivy was just named the third most fastest growing company in the country, state of Vermont. Um, and something like 68% increase over a year. Um, and George Ivey is becoming a good friend of Revitalizing Waterbury and made a simple donation to George support. Pierce. George Pierce. Pierce. Good friend of Revitalizing Waterbury and supported our Waterbury Acts of Kindness program in, in November that was, um, you know, small but impactful, saying thank you to people in the community. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to say that I, I think the investment in RW goes a long way. Um, yeah, I've been sitting on that revitalizing Waterbury Economic Board for <coughs> since Darren was the first. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I'm glad that there's a focus on housing, and I think we're going to be talking about it more and more, but with these growth, growth of additional jobs and just demand through whether it's tourism or whatever else, that I think housing has to be talked about. And to your point, Chris, and we talked about this before, groundless growth is a, is a way to, to stabilize and continue to make water very affordable. So it's figuring out how to, I'm assuming the report's going to tell you to increase the number of multifamily high density housing in the downtown. I'm assuming that's going to be one of them because that, to me, is the, the, the lowest paying fruit from right. a housing perspective. Um, so. The fact that you, as an organization, are doing that work, I think, is huge and is going to pay off dividends long term for the affordability of this town and making supply demand balance itself. Again, because right now, there is no supply. And yeah. I know the number of conversations I have with people about not being able to find housing is unbelievable. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's a very important part. Um, I think it's hard for for me to know that. You know, it's a it's a thirty six percent increase. I think is what I quickly calculated. It's about twenty three thousand. Mm -hmm. So you know, we haven't really gotten into all the budgets to fully understand the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. I right now in my head support it. I just we haven't seen everything laid out to know that we can support it. So I'm assuming we don't have to vote on anything tonight. But, no, right. Um, no. Yeah, and I understand. But there's also some offset, Mark, in the in the planning budget, which Steve Watsfield will be presenting a week from now. There's already a five thousand uh, dollar beautification line, and I'm not sure we need all of that five thousand. The ninety six hundred. So there's a little bit of an offset too. Okay. And I'm with you, Mark. I, I'm a. I believe in what RW does, but I'm, I'm concerned about, as Chris is concerned, the totality. It, everything's kind of additive, and then you know we have to see what's all. Because I think very few people are going to be not asking for some increases in some, and we just have to sort through what some of those increases are, and to see if we have a budget that's sustainable that people can afford and and run, run our town in an efficient way. If Bill does budgets like I do budgets, and my board knows what I do, I do the first thing, I put everything what everybody wants in, and I run it, and I go, well, that ain't gonna work, and then we start playing. And, it's about uh, how he does it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, but no, I no. but I can only, and my, my simple statement is um, the answer is no if I don't ask, so. And I, I think we just want to say thank you for um, you know the support you have provided to Revitalizing Waterbury. It's really support for the community because we wouldn't be here unless there was a, a need for that. And um, you know maybe one of, maybe one of our um, downfalls has not been to sort of incrementally ask for increases over the years. Um, 
Um, and you know, so we've held the line for a number of years, and uh, uh, so we're, we hope that you give it some positive consideration. Thank you. And I, and I hope you people all know that we extremely appreciate everything you've done. Um, Absolutely. Like I said, you're almost like an extension of the government. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so you take care of very important things in this town and the uh, municipality itself either doesn't have the funding to do or other other the economy. So I appreciate it. Yep. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry to take so much of your time. Sorry, folks. It's a good discussion. <laughs> but it was nice to be first on the Thank agenda. You. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, Hello. Well, that was really interesting. I've completely forgotten what I've got to say. <laughs> um, so. That's not plugged in, Mike. Oh, it's not plugged in? No. That's okay. I should have enough juice. All righty. So I'm joined uh, online. I have Maureen White, my treasurer, online to help with any numbers orientated things. Hi, Maureen. Um, so first of all, thank you for the opportunity to come in to speak to you. Um, it, it was almost exactly one year ago when I last uh, was speaking to you, and that was by Zoom. Um, and at that time, I was very, very new to the position um, and uh, really appreciated some of the, uh, some of the words uh, from your board here. In that time, a lot has happened. Um, we are now up to a board, eight people strong. We just have one open space at the moment. I'm um, very pleased about that, and I'm pleased that that is a very active board. Um, I, I promise that, that uh, uh, as my, uh, in my chairperson role, I would make sure that the bylaws were online, the public is welcome to all of our meetings, um, and we get our, our minutes published. Uh, and I'm very pleased that in the last year that has happened. We've had uh, very, very good attendance at our board meetings. So from that board oversight, I'm very happy in, in the direction we're going. Um, we have, in the last year, had a couple of changes with our staff. Um, in, back in February, um, our cook, uh, Kim Huff, uh, resigned. Uh, and we were able to, since then, hire Donna Barr uh, as our cook, and Donna came with lots of experience from the Norwich campus in Northfield. Um, and things are going really well there. We're getting great reviews on the actual food coming out of the kitchen, as well as some really good management practices. We're seeing food donations. Um, being dealt with in a very responsible way and all of our own produce and busts we're seeing again very responsibly being dealt with. Um, we also uh, lost our kitchen slash program as, um, assistant in August um, and uh, we have since then hired Ali Yandau and Ali is actually a uh, part-time schedule with us while she is also working on her master's degree in epidemiology, I always have to get that right, epidemiology uh, in public health at UVM. And Ali is great. She'll turn her hand to anything needed. And most importantly, the seniors absolutely adore her. So uh, very pleased with that. So I mentioned a couple of changes with staffing. Well, I, since originally putting together my notes, I need to expand that a tiny bit to probably to say a few changes. Um, our director, Vicky Brooker, um, resigned last Friday for personal reasons. So um, currently have a, a job opening for uh, a director. Um, our board has very quickly put together a job searching committee and uh, on a day-to-day -day basis our board members are stepping in so we have 
mooring almost daily, checking in, make sure the money side of things are being looked after. Um, I'm looking after uh, checking email accounts and that sort of thing. Um, and we will make sure that we have that position filled soon with a great candidate. So moving on from there, um, lots of great work has happened in the last year from our treasurer, Mooring. Um, for instance, generally tidying up the bookkeeping process uh, is now in a really, really nice, nice place. I don't know if anyone remembers last year I had reported that there was uh, uh, a payroll tax arrears that we were working on at that time and pleased to let you know that all of that backdated tax is now up to date and we're currently just working on the last abatement request with the IRS at the regional level just to see if we can get a few of those penalties uh, reduced. So again, great strides uh, in that side of things. Um, so also last year talking with you guys was the suggestion that it would be good if we had an audit and that was a very scary thing at the time the cost possibly you know, five six seven thousand dollars for a full audit to take place uh, for a small non-profit is a fairly scary thought um, when every every penny is quite hard fought for but I'm pleased to announce that uh, with a little bit of one-time um, uh, money that has come in this year, let's call it COVID money, uh, we've been able to make that happen and uh, I, we have that for later on this month, that audit will be starting. So again, great strides. Thank you for you guys pushing us last year in the right direction. That is happening. Um, and as I mentioned towards our budgeting process, uh, we run October to September, so we already have a budget in place and starting operational for this current year. Um, one, of the, one of the parts we do there, we put out our annual appeal to the town. So I think just before Christmas, you should have all received your own uh, notice through the door as our, as our own little um, asking a letter to the community. Um, it's too early to say for sure how that is doing, but we think we are on track to meet our budget on that side of things. So again, we're happy that we are in the right direction with some of our budgetary um, uh, side of things. So moving on to a mention about pandemic. Well, um, the governor's lockdown did mean that the centre had to completely close its doors to the public. Um, so we did have to stop congregate um, gatherings at that time. That also meant that our dominoes and bingo, our foot clinic, flu clinic, and any other community uh, programs that were using the space had to stop as well. So, um, that's a pretty, a pretty tough thing for the senior centre to deal with. Um, but having said that, to say we closed our doors was not strictly true because in the background, our Meals on Wheels continued. We never missed a day of delivering to our seniors for their Meals on Wheels. So that's five deliveries each week. Um, that doesn't only include the calories in the food being delivered, but also includes a wellness check and a few minutes conversation with that person to make sure they're okay. Uh, a very underestimated part of, of what that delivery is, in fact, is, the, uh, is that wellness check. So, um, <clears throat> so having to close the dining area um, did actually in the background give us a bit of extra time to help freshen things up. We have a fresh coat of paint, uh, we have fresh signage, so things like that we were able to spruce things up, you know. Um, uh, use that downtime very well ourselves to tidy things up. Uh, that meant 
that once the relaxation of the official state rules came into place, we were able to get going back again Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for our congregate meals. Um, and my best day of the year, in fact, was that first day back for our congregate meals. Uh, some of the faces of the people who hadn't, hadn't seen each other for months. And that conversation, the, the bright smiling faces of the seniors, uh, definitely my best day of the year, definitely. So with the space now open again, it has also allowed us to do other things. It has allowed us in October, we hosted a craft fair uh, along with the Eastern Star. And that cooperation with the Eastern Star ladies helped to raise about $2,000. <coughs> so that process, uh, again, uh, I think tells a lot towards the value of that space on Stowe Street being used in that way. Um, and the public being able to see that space used in a, in a good way. So fantastic to see it open. And the space being open also allowed the Waterbury Ambulance, three weeks ago, uh, they had a COVID vaccination and uh, unbelievably got 64 people in just the three hour slot that they had the space <coughs> for, which uh, even they were amazed, expecting no more than 15 or 20 and uh, amazed when I turned up to lock up after them, they were like, wow, we should have had a bit of extra time. 64 people really pleased. But again, just some of, the, some of the added value of having that space there used and open. Um, so again, a quick mention of some of the other small programs um, we, we have running. Um, we run a movie night once a month on the first Sunday. Uh, myself as the projectionist, uh, very often um, uh, very often some kind of a musical. Uh, I'll project that on the wall and we have our seniors enjoying popcorn, candy, um, all of, you know, the old fashioned candy in the boxes just as if you're going to the movies. Um, so a uh, fun event there. Um, Domino's takes place twice a week after our congregate meals. Um, we also host a foot clinic. Um, the senior centre manages that traffic and acts as a, a waiting room um, for that process to take place. We have also hosted uh, flu clinic. Again, we look after some of the management uh, of the lists of who's going to be in when. Um, again, all things that show the value of having that space there to have these co-events with other organisations. And along with co-events, the uh, Waterbury Historical Society uh, puts on one event each month with us. It might, for instance, um, be uh, they did a foliage tour. They used the town recreation van and took a group, I think it was 10, um, that went off on a foliage uh, tour with the, uh, with the folks from the Historical Society helping put that on. Uh, they've also, um, at the centre, put on uh, presentations. I think the last one was Don Fields and the Pony Boys. Some, a little bit of music in there, a little bit of history. Um, again, very fun uh, input. And the most recent was a Christmas sing-along. That, um, I don't know, everyone should go to one of those. It's, it's really quite a thing. Um, and um, sometimes forgotten is our medical equipment loaner program. So the basement at the senior centre is quite a large space. Um, we have a huge collection of wheelchairs, knee walkers, um, crutches, all sorts of devices. So if anyone, whoever you are, it doesn't matter if you have full insurance, come see us. We probably have the medical equipment you need. Um, you can, if you just need it for a week after a short procedure, come and see us, you can borrow it. Um, we equally don't mind if you're going to need something very long term and probably never to 
bring that equipment back. It's, we have lots of equipment it needs using. So having mentioned how good it is to have the space open and our programs all active, you are no doubt aware of the high number of COVID cases right now. And with all of that extra concern uh, about keeping our seniors safe and also trying to, um, trying to make sure we don't have any problems with our own kitchen so that we can't provide meals on wheels, we have had to, uh, uh, this is actually uh, fresh news last night with a meeting, we are pausing congregate meals at the centre for a two week time frame. Starting this Friday will be the first not open for two weeks. Um, the hope is then we can reassess and the hope is we can then be back open again. We hope. Um, uh, and again, this is probably the toughest decision that our board has, has had to make. Um, <coughs> when the governor forced us to shut, that wasn't us making a decision to shut. Okay, we had to. Uh, whereas this is a, a very hard fought decision, how we, how we work to do the best overall. So we're going to see how it goes. We're calling it a pause for two weeks and see how we go. Um, so some of our other programs go with that. That means uh, staying to play dominoes after the congregate meals, not a good idea. So that has to stop as well. Um, but we are still open, for instance, if the ambulance service wants to use the space for another vaccination clinic, no problem. We can accommodate them, no problem at all. So, let's see, let's, uh, let's go a little bit more upbeat and throw a few numbers around the table. Um, in the last year, the number of meals served were 18,157. And yes, we, we do count them. I was gonna ask you that. Yeah, every Have single- you delivered meals? Uh, this is actually a combination of delivered and, and the congregate together. Um, so yes, every, every single day spreadsheets are filled out and we also have to fill in uh, reports uh, to the CBCOA, uh, where, our, where a little bit of our funding comes, comes from, and I'll mention that number in a second. Um, so that meant that with our deliveries, Meals on Wheels, that was uh, a little bit more of a, a rougher number, a 12,000 number, 12,000 deliveries made, individual deliveries to someone's doorstep. Even though I say doorstep, we will never leave a meal on a doorstep. That would just not be the right thing to do. So that is always making sure someone's okay, making sure they get their meal inside, do they need help with something, opening the milk or whatever it may be. Um, but that added well, wellness check 12,000 times in the last year. Um, so, we get a little bit of federal help, $3.76 per each one of those Meals on Wheels uh, meals we have. Um, that money also comes with a whole load of strings attached to it. Awful lot of reporting strings. Uh, <coughs> things we have to report, I'm looking at Maureen for that, so yeah. Uh, lo lots of things we have, to, we have to do that come along with that $3.76. And I'm sure you can all appreciate $3.76 does uh, definitely not cover all, everything we have to put into a meal. Um, when every single meal has to have the right amount of protein, the right amount of carbohydrates, everything. Everything is the exact amount. Um, our menu a month in advance. Uh, has to be pre-approved by the CDCOA, the Central Vermont Council on Aging. Uh, so they, they every month have to approve our menu, make sure it has the right mix of sugar, salt, all these things. So uh, uh, yeah, that magical number, $3.76. So that's based on individual needs? You have to match the meal with 
their dietary needs? Um, there's, just... there's not too much of that. If somebody has a particular allergy, we take that into account. But if somebody just doesn't like green beans, that's tough. <laughs> okay. Um, so we, we get funding from six of our local towns. Uh, of, of those six and the number we, uh, number we serve, there's my, I think I'm missing one number here, but um, <coughs> um, so, so currently Waterbury residents make up 68% of the deliveries we make, okay? And if we look at the contributions <coughs> Uh, town by town, Waterbury's contribution makes up 63% of the contributions we get in from our six towns. <coughs> so uh, just as an overall statement, it has been a hard year for all non-profit organizations. It's been tough for our towns alike. It's, it's, it's not a great, a great year, definitely, trying to fundraise in a non-profit environment. Um, we have prepared our budget um, based on last year's numbers to try and level fund in what we get in from our towns. Uh, that is our hope. So uh, based, on, based on that, um, we would like to be considered uh, for funding at $32,500. And with the, that was last year's, so 32,500, with the thought that 68% would, so to meet the, the match percentage of the number of meals, would be an increase going up to 35,000 <coughs> and a little bit. So 35,080 would make that to 38%, uh, sorry, to 68%. With that, I'll ask any questions, and if they are particularly numbers orientated, Maureen is here to assist. Questions for the board? A few questions. One, I assume by what you presented to us that your fiscal year is October 1st to September 30th? Correct, yes. Okay, just making sure that, that we're just not getting old, old numbers. That, that, that is right, yes. Okay, great. Um, I know last year was very tough on nonprofits. <coughs> oh, volunteering for nonprofits and fundraising. You know, I noticed it looks like under your totals for last year, your actuals was a little under two thousand dollars, and you're projecting thirty-three thousand two hundred dollars. How how do you plan on getting to that level? That's the contributions or the or the fundraising. It's under fundraising line item. It says fundraising events, 32,000 is most of it, and bake sales is $1,200. So, event, so it's okay. primarily events. I don't think it's like yeah. kind of like a, you know, soliciting money from You're right. you know, local people. You're right. So the, the, the particular low number from last year um, was because we were not able to use the center to host any events. For instance, we couldn't have a spaghetti dinner right. and have the public come in. We couldn't do things like that. Um, we have some ideas. Um, we are working on some ideas that don't use the physical space. Um, but at the moment, all of those ideas require people to be in close-ish proximity, and it's just not a good thing to happen at, um, happen at the moment. Um, so yes, some of our project projections or re just that project. rely, uh, <coughs> at this stage, uh, right. but we don't know when we will be back to normal. People to host events and stuff. Um, in the same way as last year, there were, uh, we were very low on those income numbers. Um, magically, that does in other ways uh, get topped up. There were a couple of uh, one-off um, uh, one pots of money available to us in various grants and things like that available to senior centres. Um, our hope is that 
if there are particular pandemic problems, that some of those will be available to us in the same way to try and to try and even things up. Because in the budget, some of those COVID-related things that you received last year might not be available again this year, although you might be able to get some ARPA money from places. Correct. Some may not, but some different as well in different exactly. ways. Um, so we have to stay optimistic at some point that the COVID won't stay forever. And, in, and until then, we will do what we can. Okay, thanks. What, uh, what were the two numbers there that Last year, same. Thirty-two five. And the same. The increase is what? Uh, the request is 32.5, but he said that we could go to 35 to match that 68.68. 68. So the request potentially is 32.5 to 35. 25. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Danny, any questions? Yeah, and, and so is it the five towns that are involved? There are in six, six, six towns. Bolton being? Bolton included, yeah. And <coughs> the building itself, does Waterbury carry that? How does any no. of that burden? Small, but that expands? Down street. Right. Down street, I think, yeah. Yeah, down street. <coughs> A lot of work, a lot of effort. I uh, commend you for doing such a great job. Um, if, if I'm understanding your, your budget proposal here, of course, the way I do numbers, the way municipality is such do numbers, minus is mean plus, plus means minus. Right. In this particular case, it looks like you may end up 2022 at negative 10,000. Is that? What this is showing? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that, is, that, is, that is correct. Um, I budgeted the 10000 because that's what the audit would cost, probably. So um, I was OK with not being a net zero budget, just being off the 10000 which we would pay for with last year's surplus that we have. So that's kind of where I got the 10000 loss. So for basically a net zero budget. Okay. Good job. Okay. Yeah, well, I want to say thank you as well. I, I mean, obviously, you do an incredible amount of work for not a large budget, so um, thank you for everything. And who knows? Each one of us, maybe we were a recipient of some other services at some point in time. <laughs> well, well, I, said, well, I, I had a great meal there. Yeah. Well, one, once, <laughs> it's, it's uh, good food. Well, once we are back open again, please come and join us one of these lunch times and come and see the food that gets thrown out at the kitchen is great quality food. And some of the conversation with the seniors just astounds me every time I, I turn up for lunch. The seniors love seeing, you know, people under the age of 65. <laughs> I, I, I love my senior friends, I can tell you that. It's, I like to live in the past. <laughs> yeah, that's and, it. and to confirm, the general public can rent that space. They can, yes. Yes. I feel like that's a really important thing to make sure they're not. I feel like that's some revenue that obviously COVID doesn't help so, with that much. That's right. And in some of the ways we have the facilities there, there's ice maker there, there's projector ready if people want uh, music or uh, movie or anything anything like that. It's it's quite nice in that way. So it's a great point. Yeah, that is a It's been hard point. to do with COVID. Yeah, sure. So, well, any other part of the maintenance aspect, sounds like you guys are staying on top of that as much as you can. We have the two sides. If there's anything major electrical, we go to our landlord. Yep. But apart from that, um, we look after many of the bits ourselves. Yep. Get in a, a, a volunteer painting crew. The Rotary Club was great there. Yep. Uh, a few people to slap some paint around, make it make it look really nice. Um, yes. Thanks, Justin. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Justin. Mad River Resource Management Alliance. Where is here? Let's see. Thank you for your patience. No
Phil would say it wouldn't be right if I didn't have something for everybody to recycle. <laughs> you should be giving this up electronically. We didn't get anything digitally about this, did we, Phil? No, oh, no, yet. we didn't. This is John. You will. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, once again come before this August group on a less than August evening. Uh, the Med River Resource Management Alliance continues to uh, do uh, the work of dealing with the garbage of the world, at least in the uh, five communities that we serve. Our major uh, project, as always has been, is the household hazardous waste collections. And this year, as with last year, COVID has struck and created some problems for us. We only were able to hold one event, both in 2020 and 2021. <coughs> 2021, we couldn't get a contractor that could support with resources to uh, provide us with uh, the necessary equipment to uh, <coughs> hold our second event. But uh, that being said, uh, we did hold the spring event and uh, we had 122 uh, households in Waterbury that participated and they represented 34% of the total of uh, 359 households. Plus there were some businesses that participated uh, from our community here. We collected uh, 10.19 tons of household hazardous waste uh, during the collection activities. And I'm pleased to say that we do have a contractor uh, for 2022. Uh, unfortunately, because of circumstances, uh, we couldn't get the dates that we normally would have had for the events. So our spring event is going to be a uh, uh, April 2nd instead of our normal second Saturday in May. And our fall event is going to be the 20th of August. Uh, I don't know if I'm pushing global warming or uh, doing something else, but uh, we're able to hold two events. We will have a lot of publicity because there are going to be some changes with the new uh, contractor. We're going to have to have all of the businesses that are participating front loaded so that they're all taken care of uh, at the very beginning of the event due to uh, paperwork issues that the uh, contractor is dealing with. So they need to get all the small business generators of household hazardous waste to take their stuff in. We have in the past been pretty flexible about when people can come and we just intersperse them. But uh, this is a, uh, a group that has certain requirements and we've got to deal with them. Uh, we collected approximately 384 tons of food scraps through both Grow Compost and their uh, follow-up organization called Casella. And uh, they're doing much of the transportation of uh, food scraps around the state now. There are some smaller uh, companies also doing that. And uh, I should report that uh, they have put in an application uh, at the Grow Compost facility to be able to take, uh, you know, totes, they'll have totes there, like what had been happening uh, when Grow Compost was operating. At this moment, they are not able to take food scraps from the general public, but once they do successfully get their permit, that is part of what they want to accomplish, which would be uh, uh, something that would be welcomed by the residents. They had a good 
uh, base of folks that didn't want to get a compost bin, uh, didn't want to bring it to another site, but like the concept of free. Can't argue with it. Uh, our Green Up Day event uh, was pretty successful. We uh, collected uh, over nine tons of tires uh, on Green Up Day. Uh, 236, 239 of those were truly Green Up tires that were brought in by volunteers that found them in, not in their garage, uh, found them along the riversides and roadsides and places in between that uh, needed to be cleaned up. And uh, 163 of those were from Waterbury. So I like to think that that's because there's a strong volunteer corps in Waterbury that went out and got all these tires because 68% of the tires that were collected were collected in the Waterbury area by the Green Up folks in Waterbury. So that was good. Uh, we also had, I think, one of the most exciting additions this year to the Alliance, and that is that we once again are able to take textiles, uh, both in Waterbury at Rodney's and down at the Earthwise Transfer Station in Waitsfield. Uh, a company called Helpsy uh, is the broker. They're taking the, uh, these materials at no charge. The materials are going back to uh, their processing facilities uh, down in New York, and they are uh, separating out the stuff that is still good to sell, and they're putting it on the market through uh, uh, different uh, 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 stores, discount stores and the like. Uh, and then stuff that is not usable is being used for insulation or uh, made into rags. They have three criteria. Criteria is it's gotta be clean, it's gotta be dry, and it's gotta be odor free. But beyond that, they'll take uh, shoes, they'll take all manner of clothing, they'll take all manner of linens, they'll take your pet's uh, sweater, they'll take all kinds of uh, things like canvas and uh, other odds and ends that uh, would be found in a uh, dresser drawer and the like. Uh, we're continuing to collect electronic waste, both over at the uh, uh, state surplus property facility right outside of town and down at Earthwise at no charge. Uh, this year we collected, yeah, I used to we, you know, it's like I'm collecting, uh, 27.56 tons of electronic waste. It's quite a substantial amount of stuff. We also continue to uh, sell compost bins and green cones. This past year we sold about 28 bins and three green cones. Uh, plus, I do a couple of workshops on uh, composting in your backyard. And if you didn't want to watch the, uh, the workshop, you can go on YouTube. It was taped one year. And I find that it's a very good sleep inducer if you're looking for an alternative to be able to get a good night's sleep. Uh, our assessment for 2022 is going to remain at $7. Uh, the census from 2010 to 2020 uh, raised the number in the population a little bit. Uh, but it's not a substantial amount of uh, additional money. It's about $5,000 more for the whole alliance. Uh, so basically, Waterbury's assessment's going to go up $1,869, but it'll be the same $7. But I got I to caution everybody that uh, we're we're okay right now financially, but part of the reason we're okay right now is because we only held the one event 
this year and the one event last year. And based on the numbers that the new contractor is throwing at us, it looks like our rate's going to be going up like 40 percent. So I just, I'm, I'm going to see what else we can do, but the pricing on this is just not sustainable. Uh, there is legislation that's been proposed uh, in the uh, House Natural Resources Committee on uh, product stewardship dealing with uh, hazardous materials, hazardous waste specifically, and it would give more of the responsibility for the cost of disposal to the industry, much like what we have for paint, architectural latex and oil-based paint, much like what we have for the e-waste that we have uh, that's collected, uh, and similar things to fluorescent bulbs and, and the like. So that's the general uh, gist of what we're at. Uh, as always, you know, I have two requirements to ask of you before I'll ask for any questions. And one is to uh, continue to support or reappoint uh, our representative from Waterbury who has very, uh, very effectively represented us, and that's Alec Tuscany. And the other is to approve the budget. So those are the, the asks, but let me ask you to ask me. On the board? Just one quick question, and this is more just something of interest. I know people are more and more concerned about electronics and personal information. When you do through surplus, is that all electronically scrubbed? Uh, no. Everything they recommend that anybody that's got anything <coughs> sensitive should make sure that whatever hard drives or it's whatever off. is destroyed beforehand. I know that the folks that collect this stuff from uh, American Retro Works does make an effort to deal with that, but right. there's no guarantee. And I always say, you want to be sure of something, as best you can be sure of something like that, do it yourself. That would be the point there. Thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Um, obviously, this is important that we continue to fund this organization and the work that you do. So, I'm very, very appreciative of everything you do and the amount of waste that's coming up. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, obviously, the contractor increased costs. You know, I, I think costs are going across the board, and that's unfortunate that the organization has to see that kind of increase. So. We'll definitely take that into account. Um, any other questions, Danny? You got any? Okay. Um, do we, again, do we need to actually make a motion this evening? I think if you, if you want some appointment. Okay. So to make a motion to <coughs> Alex Tuskin, is that I don't usually do that after I know, time. but that's the, that would be a motion, but the motion on <coughs> it doesn't necessarily need to happen this evening. Right. We do the appointments after town meeting. Okay. Okay. So no appointment this evening. No. So the only ask I have of you, if Alec gets reappointed, is continue to listen to him with regard to how you deal with people from Duxbury. That your hazardous waste collections and that's why I have so much here. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Not a of the yeah. Right. Yeah. That, that's the one. Yeah, I've been doing this now 25 years. Wow. And 10 years ago, I became a senior citizen. That is scary. <laughs> anyway, anything else? Nope. 
Good evening. Good evening, Gary. I have never come here and expected to be on time. <laughs> we never expect to get out of here on time. <laughs> right. I, right. Um, I think Bill's provided all the information to you. The only comments that I'll make beyond that, and then I'll leave it for you to ask questions, is that you may notice uh, if you I don't know. Bill, did you provide him with my list of stuff? Um, no. I did, but maybe I didn't. I, I don't think so. I okay. think I could do that. No. Well, anyways, if you happen to see it, you'll I'll, see there's, there's some redundancy from last year to this year, and that's because after the tower truck had an extremely high uh, maintenance cost, I'm talking with Bill, we cut back on a, a lot of things that we could just put off until next year. But that means that there's an additional cost to that. So uh, I think overall the budget came in pretty well. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look right in the middle of the page, the vehicle maintenance line, uh, we spent three times as much as we budgeted. Uh, most of that was for the power truck, which had to go to Connecticut for an extended stay. Right. And uh, as you can see, if you look at the bottom line of the spending, uh, even though we were three times up on that, we were still about $12,000 down near the date. When you go into the projected column, there's some expenses that we haven't got, uh, paid bills for. So we're going to be a little lower, I think, than what we budgeted for the year, even though we went well over there. Uh, some of that is just, again, uh, I guess you're kind of continuing the the pace of calls not anywhere near like we used to oh. have 15 years ago. Not, not, even, not even close. And, uh, and that's saving us money. Even though I did bump those two line items up, the regular pay and the part time pay, I bumped them up a little bit just to reflect the fact that we need to give some additional uh, pay per hour to the, to the uh, firefighters. But, uh, I didn't ask for it this year, and I don't know if you even provided it for me, but your calls to the interstate must be way down compared to what they used to be in terms of, uh, you know, they were well for. Overall, they're way down. Um, I just did my town report tonight. I'll be emailing it off to the nice lady on the side. And, uh, but the calls on the interstate were up over last year, but a lot of that um, was not due to snow or it was just different things. So when we have a call on the interstate for a car that slid off or a lot of times it's a vehicle hit a deer as an example and now the car is smoking. It's not smoking, it's steam. And so we will contact the state police before we even leave the station to make sure that they're headed there and verify that it is or is not smoke and we don't go. Um, you could ask just about every firefighter has been on the department for a lengthy period of time and gone on that interstate for years and they would take a, you know, a, any other call over going on that interstate. Uh, it is a dangerous place. We get new people that think they're godlike and they'll just walk down and not pay any attention. Um, it's just a dangerous place. So we will do everything that we can possibly do to not go up there. And I've even tried to give it to Stowe. They came down and covered for us one time when we were at a call. And they took a call on the interstate and they could not wait to get it off the interstate. Uh, so that, yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, we cut back on training because again, there's some COVID related trainings um, that, you know, there's one of them that I was thinking about attending, but it was two days, eight hours a day on Zoom. I'm not doing that. Um, I just cannot sit in front of a computer that long. Uh, so there are some things opening up this year. We don't know what uh, the virus is gonna provide for us, but um, I think if we stop making it a political issue, we'd have less problems in understanding. But. 
So it's just back to the that. beginning of what he said. If you look at the new equipment line, four lines up from the bottom, budget was seventy-five thousand last year. It's eighty-one thousand two fifty this year, but that's one of the line items that Gary pulled back on to compensate for that vehicle maintenance. So uh, even though it's a sixty-two fifty about a year ago, uh, he's trying to make up for a little lost time, so to speak. Yeah. So. Yeah, delaying the purchase of something, we did it. Um, I remember doing it when the economy went down the drain. Uh, after Irene, we did it. But that all has an impact down the road. You, you know, when you say we're going to cut budgets, and I certainly understand, I'm not complaining. There's, a, there's a, a yin and a yang to that. You have to make up for that at some point. Um, but I think right now with this budget, we'll be doing pretty good for what we need to do. Uh, we are going to do some more preventative maintenance on our pumps. Um, there's a, a vendor out there that will come to our station and do those in-house, pull them out into the apron, do the preventative maintenance, and that will help us not have broke hoses and, because one trip from him down here is a hundred bucks just to get on a road. So, um, as I've reported before, you know inflation is probably pretty hot right now. Uh, <clears throat> this is a three percent increase in the total fire budget, which is below the rate of inflation right now. I think it's a very sustainable budget. Contract with Dexter is up slightly from uh, a year ago, three point four eight percent. One thing just to let you know, this may change uh, because the Supreme Court heard a case last week and the report that I had was the, the conservative justices on the, report, on the court were asked a lot of questions and seemed disinclined to continue to allow the uh, Biden administration to require uh, testing for employee, employers over 100 people. And while you don't really know it when you look at us uh, from a standard lens, but when you look at the town of Wabi through the lens of how that uh, Department of Labor rule is written, uh, if that is upheld by the court, uh, come May uh, or June at the latest, we will be over 100 employees. And the rule says that uh, if you're over 100 employees, you have to, all your employees have to be vaccinated or they have to uh, submit to once per week testing, uh, which is onerous. It doesn't say that the employer has to pay for the testing, but just having that as uh, something that we would have to do could be uh, difficult. One of the reasons why we're over 100 is the fire department. And I don't want the fire department to go away or, or reduce their numbers, but they have reduced their roles a little bit. Yep. I think you're in the 45 yep. range or something We're in like that. Mid 40s. Yeah. But the, the Department of Labor rules says that anybody that gets paid, uh, including volunteer fire departments, including uh, summer or seasonal recreation help, uh, are considered employees. So when we have and it's on a, on a, I forgot what they call it, but it's uh, at any given point in time. So we don't, if, if this is upheld, we wouldn't have to subject our employees to this now, but as soon as we hit the magic number, which would happen in June when Nick hires uh, rec staff, we'd be over 100. So just so you know, uh, if that's upheld, I'd be surprised if it's upheld based on what I heard last week. But if it is, you're going to have to deal with it. So. And is select board members part of that? Yeah, they are. We're paid. But there's only five of you. So even if you all say no to your money, it's not going to change anything. <laughs> <laughs> that all of our members are vaccinated. Some chose not to get the booster. Not my business. Um, but they are all fully vaccinated uh, according to the standards. Right. Do you have any, um, I'm just curious, you said your, the numbers are down a little bit. 
you know, as you see all around the countryside, you see hiring, hiring, hiring. Do you, are you worried about no. numbers? No, I'm not worried about it. Um, you know, I'm, we're in a unique position that I worry about it because we have in the 40s as right. opposed to into the 50s. Um, but, you know, we've, every 10 years or so, we do this kind of thing. You yeah. know, people get done. We With have, all the requirements and stuff, people well, are... that's really not even it. We, during our training, we hit all the requirements that they need to have. Um, new members have to go to what's called Firefighter One. And we've got one guy that we gave him a pass this year if he wanted to because he could not get into the closest one, which is Williston. But there was one open in Orleans. So that's where he goes two days a week and every other Saturday. Um, so he can get his firefighter one. Um, so it, that's not, that really isn't the issue. Um, it's just a matter of a year ago we had three people that had over 20 years. Yeah, they, ready. They, yeah. You know, the, it's, there are still members that have, you know, 30, 35, 40, I mean, this is my, this coming year is my 41st year on the department. So those lifelong members are very few and far between. But if we can get 10 years out of somebody, I'm happy. Right. Uh, and, and this is one of the things that you know, I talk about a lot at town managers associations meetings. And you know, we have a lot of dedicated people we're in a unique place in Waterbury. Uh, I don't know how it is now, but years ago, the fact that we had the state complex in Waterbury, there were a lot of firefighters who were employees of the state who allowed them to be able to make you know, protocols and things like that. So partly it's uh, kind of the luck of where we are and who our employers are. Uh, some of our bigger employers, Ben Jerry's always was willing to allow people to be on the ambulance or the fire department. I think Coffee Roasters was. Um, but the other thing, and I don't want to minimize this at all, is I think that we have people that are willing to do it because the town supports the fire department. Correct. We provide equipment. We provide training. And I don't mean just trucks when I say equipment. The personal protective gear right. that they have to have. Um, you know, we invest wisely in this department and it helps us have 45 or 50 people that are willing to do it as opposed to there's a lot of times around us that are like scraping around 15 people uh, 15 some of those departments would be extremely happy to have um, we are very fortunate you know we don't have as many members that work for the state any longer um, we have two one uh, works in Middlesex, she, unless she happens to be at something, she responds during the day. And we have one that works for uh, um, AOT, and he's an engineer, and he's in his home office four days a week, so he can respond. Um, we have one that works for a, a neighboring highway department. He can respond unless it's in the middle of a snowstorm, as an example, or they're replacing culverts. So, you know, we're fortunate there are departments around us that don't have the financial support that uh, we have. You know, I know that sometimes when you look at the equipment list that I put out and you look and you see a flashlight for $75, and you know, it's like, well, you can go buy a, a flashlight for, you know, five bucks, but it's not going to last. It doesn't have the intensity and it's not intrinsically safe. Um, just like our radios, there's, you know, we've been using the same radios for God, probably more than 25 years and they, we can't get them anymore and so we bought one other option and it's very expensive. It can do a lot, but all we really need is to be able to push a button talk and listen. Okay. But technology's catching up on us and some stuff that we have to do. You know, a fire coat now is a little over 1600 bucks. Um, so. It, it's pricey, and we appreciate it. We appreciate what you guys do. So, based on your budget and the fact that you kind of scaled back on 
on some things to make up for this expense on the ladder truck. Um, do you have an idea of um, what additional revenue you'd be asking for for next year? Uh, and what I'm thinking is, depending on how like the season works out here, if there was something that we could do this year to offset next year. Yeah. I can check. Um, I have, I have people. <laughs> I, I have, uh, I have one person that takes care of all the gear. He has a spreadsheet, and he knows when it's got to be replaced. That would be a, a an item that we would take a look at. I have an officer that is in charge of pagers and radios. I have other officers, three of them that are in charge of all the training. I, I have no idea, other than I heard one of them talking a couple days ago. What we're we typically do on a training night. Uh, it's not my thing. That's right. what I have people for. So uh, you're not suggesting that that would happen, but no, no, no. I, I if it could happen. happen. I'd rather see it happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The pain. Yeah. I, I, I can think of a couple things that I will throw out and just let Bill know. And well, and the other thing too, and I think I wrote about it in my brief memo, but uh, if you look at the two capital fund line, which is now at the bottom. Um, you know, I, we, we transferred $192,000 last year. I added 14000 to that. That goes into this capital equipment fund for the fire trucks, basically, in the, in the station. And part of that is for what we talked about last week, Chris, putting some money mm -hmm. aside for building maintenance or you know, future building uh, repairs. So what I had told Gary, and I think I put it in your memo, but you know, if, if at the end of the month we're in a position and we find that we have to cut, you know, that's a $14,000 increase to that line. We could cut that by $6,000 and still have it be an $8,000 increase to that line. But Gary can look at other equipment needs too and see if there's anything there. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll see where we are in general. But um, I thought that given that there was a little capacity in here to get to the 3% increase level, that I put that money in that line just as a placeholder. So, so speaking of that, maintenance, um, we had taken a look at some of the siding issues there on the Waterbury Center Station that I had to get addressed. Yep, done. Yeah. 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 That's the Hardy Boy with you? Yeah. Okay. You did that last year. It, it's, it looks nice, and it, it's effective, but it's there's a periodic maintenance issue with it. Unlike with the, the brick facade down here. But I think it, if you were to put a brick fire station up there, it just would not look right. And the community members around when we took the drawings to them, they liked that schematic, if you will. But it's kind of like, yeah, no, it's, it's been my position right along that, uh, you know, with all these new buildings that we have now, including the one that is not quite so new, we probably should have some additional work at some point, um, having the funding set aside for that just makes things easier to stay on top of stuff. Right. Makes yeah, there's a couple doors sense. at the Main Street Station that, because they're outside doors, yeah. have a little corrosion that we're hoping to address this year. I mean, it's minor cost, but if we don't address it, it's going to become a major cost. Exactly. So. That's uh, the way the prices of materials. <laughs> yeah. Building, building materials. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm certain I'll send uh, Bill and the town clerk uh, my report, and also Bill can share with you the list of stuff. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I to do that. Can I ask a question? You had mentioned that call volume is down. Do you foresee that continuing to be a trend? Is that building safety standards and what's what's causing that? And then, and then my loaded question is going to be: Is it ever make sense for us to either through an outside consultant or something? Do we need to? Is there? I know there's a there's a response time by having two facilities. Yeah. Um, my question is, is some of that due to that we had a village in the town 
how many other towns our size have two facilities? Obviously, we have what we have now. But, you know, I think maybe I asked this question previously, but just understanding, especially if call volume is moving, that's one of the reasons that it sparked my question. But should we ever consider, or could the single facility handle what the town needs? So I've been around long enough that there's been three um, evaluations from outside people looking at our needs. And they always come back and have said, you know, I'm just trying to remember, um, yes, you could get rid of equipment, but then you're giving up response times. And a response time at a house fire will make all the difference between saving a house and not. Um, so the, the only redundant trucks that we have are the two tank trucks that we certainly need and the engines. So we bought two, you know, a couple years ago, and then there's one that's 10 years old. But the, the other trucks are a tower truck, uh, a utility truck that carries all the residual stuff. Uh, we have a, a mini pumper that gets down narrow roads and long driveways, and we have a brush truck. So there really isn't a lot of redundancy. And if we were to eliminate an engine, that could have an impact sitting here, but you don't know. Yeah, and I think it's a reasonable question, Mark, but yeah. and, and Chris was very involved when these stations were built. And we looked at trying to build a centralized location for one station. Uh, the difficulty now is that if we were to get rid of the a station, we would have to get rid of equipment because unless we're going to build a, a new station right. centralized again. Uh, so I think in the in the immediate term, it's really not feasible to think about going to one one station. And we looked at um, in the vicinity of Gupta Road and Newton yeah. Hundred for the kind of the centralized location and for a variety of reasons that we don't have to get into. It, it just didn't make. It wasn't feasible at the time, given you know, what uh, the committee thought. So. Yeah, and there's contingency planning. You know, what happens if? Uh, so a number of years ago, we were on the interstate, and we had probably our most conscientious, best driver, and we hit um, black ice where the Bolton Falls are, and historically, it's a slippery area there, and we were going probably 10 or 15 miles an hour, and lost control. And so when those big trucks start sliding, they pick up momentum. And we hit the Jersey barrier. And that was uh, $24,000 in damage. And that truck was out of service. A couple weeks later, we're on the interstate for another crash. With the other engine? With one of the other engines. Because now we have, we're down to two. And we had a tractor trailer going too fast, came around the corner, stepped on its brakes, and the box slid and slammed into the other truck and caused $26,000 in damage. And so we had one. That was service for months. Right, right. Yeah, those are not just send them to Majestic and have them fix them. Um, there were frame issues. They had to fix straighten the frame. So, you know, there is that contingency. If we were to have only two, um, we would have had none. And, you know, the old theory of uh, one is none, two is one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the redundancy of size helps, obviously, in those yeah. scenarios. Sure. And, and we can also respond to mutual aid in any other town. And we still have what we call Class A pumpers that can be here and still protect our community. Yeah, I was, just, I was just wondering if it ever, from your perspective, I, I didn't really understand the whole um, you know, call volume going down and if that's something that you foresee continuing. Uh, it's gone up this year yeah. by uh, three, four, six calls. Yeah. So it went up a little bit. But we used but to have a whole bunch more calls on the interstate. Oh, yeah, we it's used crazy. to have a whole bunch more chimney fire calls than we have now. We have maybe two maybe three chimney fires a year. Less people burning. And, well, no, I think we do a, a fall campaign of going out and cleaning chimneys for people. 
and we go out, we do it, and that has reduced our chimney fires. And we know that even though we do some of the chimneys, that we're still going to go back there. <laughs> so we go to the same places each year. We know we're going to go. Uh, no harm. We don't want people to think, oh, they don't want to come here. We do. We don't want you to wait uh, because then that turns into more of a building fire. Uh, so I think we make a lot of progress. On we have made huge progress. We used to have 20 plus chimney fires every year. I think some of this to do with economics too. I think quite honestly that the economic, the financial economic level of people in this town has risen over time, which has in turn enabled them to make the repairs on a lot of homes that uh, you know perhaps wouldn't be so vulnerable to you know, new, ch you know, new chimneys and, or different types of heat systems uh, you know, other alternatives and as time goes on with heat pumps and all that stuff and and burning wood is just not as cheap as it used to be unless you do a lot of it yourself. Nothing like that would eat, though. But, um, I think that may have some play in this production calls as well. My question, my other question now that we talk about that is how does that play into, and it may not at all, but dispatching uh, costs? Um, not slightly, not much. Yeah, it, so it, it really. It's the how we how we pay is based on. Uh, now I just lost the the, the word. It's grim list. grim list of the towns, um, and there's a element in there of number of calls. But even though our call volume has dropped over the last few years, I mean, we had a number of years ago 443 calls, and now we're down to 181. So. Where you're really saving is, you know, fuel and pay, right? Because you still have to do everything else with the trucks, right? And, and the right. dispatcher has to be there for seven, you know. Yeah. yeah. And the dispatch system has to work. And yeah, I figured it was probably a fixed call. You know, it's fixed, fixed, fixed I mean, cost. It, 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 it goes up, it goes up slightly every year. And yeah. I, I threw a few more dollars into it than Gary had asked for because there's always some upgrade or some esoteric thing that they send the bill for uh, once or twice a year. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's gone up. It used to be 35000 you know, it's gone up. But well, when it was 35000 it was 35000 for in both budgets. Uh, uh, it was 70000 back then. Uh, it's in all the one budget now. But it's frankly... It's a great deal. Uh, it's a, I mean, I, I never complain about it. There's one guy in, I don't know where he lives, but he sends me an email about 15 times a year yakking about Capital West and uh, all of the issues and the governance and how they operate and it's not fair and it's not this and that. And you write back and you tell him, it's a municipality. It's got legal status and they have a contract with Montpelier and you know what? If we had to do it ourselves, it would be, be $250,000. Yeah, so this individual just is, he, he doesn't have a regular job, so his job is going to all these meetings and complaining about every little thing that he might have slipped on. Um, <laughs> and he comes to ours. And um, I've, I was gonna say I've stepped on him, but I didn't. Um, he will try and dominate a meeting. And I made them a comment to our president that there's a public portion at the beginning of the meeting. He gets to have his say then, and then that is it. And so that shut him down. He doesn't like me, I don't care. Um, but he, he is a pain. He is a pain and he likes to, he wants all the information that he wants and he wants you to buy the equipment that he wants us to buy. And he doesn't have anything to do with any emergency response group. Yeah. It's a pain. So that's any other questions? Danny, do you have anything? Okay. Thanks, Thank you very much. Um, I have one more thing that I will I will be very brief. 
I know that the board has chosen over time to, I don't know if having a hands-off approach or uh, what you might want to call it, but something has to be done about parking. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and, you know, you know, we brought up that after you emailed the board, we did discuss it. Yeah. Um, I can't remember exactly where that conversation led, but um, go ahead and then we have been talking about another idea. Okay. So, starting before 2 o'clock for release time at 2.45, cars are at the school. And then there is literally two lanes going from Main Street, once you hit, go over the uh, dry bridge, a lot of times it's all the way back down, they block people's driveways, they block the turn to go up High Street, uh, and there are literally two lanes to go up into the school to get their kids. Uh, so if you're trying to go all the way down Stowe Street or up Stowe Street, you have to go into the opposite lane, and then you have to worry about other cars that are coming, and periodically other cars parking in the other lane. Uh, Will they move for fire trucks? I don't, yeah, probably, but I don't know where they would move to. It is that congested, that clogged, and then you turn up High Street and they park up on top of the sidewalk. So if you had somebody that was visually impaired, they're gonna walk into vehicles. So, and they're not supposed to park there. So I, I don't know what the answer is other than finding them. Uh, Maybe we need to have a parking enforcement person as an option and just walk up through and start issuing tickets. Um, there, we reached out to the principal there too, correct? Um, I did, yeah. And so Gary, yeah, that's what I was gonna follow up with is they, um, I reached out to them and it was right around the holidays, so it was a little bit wild, but basically they kind of just put it back on me and said they're doing, you know, they're doing everything they can, it's a lot better. And I said, and I used to live on High Street, so I, I was often in like a dangerous situation, sure. I believe, but I'm not there anymore, so I hadn't seen it for myself. I asked them to meet with me in person and talk, and they declined, and I wanted to go back to them, but I haven't seen it firsthand lately. So um, the first thing I thought of was maybe chatting with you and seeing if you and I would meet with them because you, you know, have more, you know, visual experience and, and know what it means. Um, so, and I had thought of some ideas like a park, you know, someone to direct parking or direct traffic during those times, like a crossing guard, but for the vehicles. Um, but that said, uh, you know, I know uh, we just recently talked with Bill about, you know, the idea of having someone have that responsibility, um, you know, a town employee in the future. So that's a bigger picture, maybe longer term solution. But, um, but I could uh, reach out to you separately and talk about that meeting with the principals. I'd be happy we met, um four or five years ago, and the principal at the time said, you know, this really isn't my problem. It's, it's an enforcement issue, and we can't tell parents they can't come pick up their kids. I, maybe they need to have a drop-off place at a parking lot someplace, maybe the, the ice, uh, outdoor ice rink. All your kids get on the bus and you're gonna wheel them down there and you can pick your kids up down there. I don't know what the answer. Then there'll be people complaining about the traffic on Butler and Wallace. Um, but it is a problem and I try and avoid it, quite honestly, because I don't wanna deal with it. I get frustrated. I, sometimes I get just downright angry when I'm sitting there for 10 minutes. And, but on Mondays I pick up my granddaughter at preschool in Bolton and I have to go by. I'm not going to just take my time and drive all over town just to avoid it for a half an hour. So, and nobody should have to wait to get to their homes or to leave their homes to go someplace. Well, the unfortunate part about it is, uh, I don't think it was always that way where parents dropped their kids off. I think Correct. School bus was a major part of education and the transportation system and how it evolved over years become what it is today. That is not the only spot that's ridiculous. either. I mean, no. if you, I mean, there are times when we have to jockey coming off Stowe Street with the new markings because people will park in that marked off area, even during the summer when you can see it, because they don't want to have to go park someplace to go into one of the local restaurants. So they've 
the park right there, and that, that is designed so larger or longer vehicles can get around there. But they park there and they park in front of the fire station because they can't see the big sign that says Waterbury Fire Department or big doors. Yeah. Um, that's a problem. Yeah, that, part of it is definitely enforcement. You know, right. If you have they don't care. It's just no, no enforcement. No, the, other thing about the people that do it are local people. Yeah. You know, back when our kids were in school, not only did our kids take the bus, but if your kid lived on Elm Street, they walked. Yes. Nobody walks in. <laughs> yes. Correct. Yeah, so um, there was a car parked in front of our fire station blocking our tower truck because it has like very little uh, good turning radius. I mean, it, it has to come all the way out, all the way to the sidewalk and beyond before you can turn it. And there was this lady, and I went around to different businesses trying to find the owner, and she finally came out of the sporting goods store, and I said, is that your car? She was, yeah. I said, well, see that fire station? Well, and their response is typically the same. Well, do you have a call? <laughs> well, call a call we, record. We have a pay for the to be on our apartment because you clearly know when the calls are going to happen. So that, or there was a uh, couple months ago, there was a truck with a big trailer that pulled up, and we would have been able to get one truck out. Uh, so it's it's a problem, and people, and most of them are local people, and they know that it's a fire station, and I'm only going to be gone for a few minutes. So you need bigger bumpers on the truck. Well, and um, you can you can YouTube uh, New York City and some other cities. That's what they do. They, they push them right out of the way. And I, I don't want to hear you complaining that I do that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Can you tell me how drive trucks? Rarely do I drive trucks. It's not my job. Hey, nothing good on TV tonight? I'm sorry, Bill. Nothing good on TV tonight. Oh, National I Championship. I uh, myself, but I decided to stop it on my way home. Okay. Well, what a nice guy. I got one person for a couple, I guess, correct. Hey, guys. Hello. Hey, Nick. Hey. What should we say, Doctor? Yeah, yeah. Dr. Nick. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've given a bunch of updates throughout the year. This we've had some special meetings with Rex, so I'll try to go through, through it pretty quickly. Um, so just to recap for this last year, uh, the pool was very successful. Uh, I don't have the historical data on it. I'm assuming it's the tightest we've ever run it. Um, it, it certainly is in my time. Uh, um, the burden that was passed off the taxpayers on that. Um, part of that was because there was a kind of a chronic funding issue uh, or a staffing issue. Um, we didn't have to close any days due to lack of staffing. Uh, that thankfully wasn't an issue. Um, we have enough summer camp staff cross trained, and you know enough of my staff owed favors where we could uh, staff keep a staff for for the hours we were were advertised to be open. But uh, the the uh, overall budget for for pay was down because of um, of that. We also closed on weekends and shifted to special events and expanding our swim lessons uh, on Saturdays. And I think that's also why we had some more revenue. Um, I got kind of creative with renting the pool. Um, well, I think that's part of the pay issue too, is that <coughs> right. you're, you're not open to the public at all on weekends anymore, right? Right, for, for non-structured events, right? right. Because and for years, we were always open uh, had to have full staff there, and we might have four people. Right. So yeah, that 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 decision was primarily driven analytically. I looked at actual data. We were spending a lot more on weekends to keep the pool open than what we'd ever make. So I, um, I never heard any complaints about no. the public on that. Nope. I got the first first day, the first uh, week we were open. I had one person who we um, already knew would probably have an issue with it have a, a minor issue with it. At the end of the summer, she bought my staff a gift card and, for Zachary's Pizza and was super thankful. So we were doing something right to, to make her happy at the end of the summer. Um, yeah, I got creative with renting it. I rented it to a robot, military robotics company in um, Richmond. They have uh, these little 
prototypes that are supposed to clean submarines um, for the military, and so they're trying out in our pool, which was very complimentary of the new patch and paint job that we had. Um, and it's pretty delicate on it. Uh, summer swim lessons were the highest uh, enrollment we had. We had over 200 kids enrolled in swim lessons. Um, we're, we ran off-season lessons this past fall, uh, and we're running currently running winter lessons. And uh, we shifted those from Berlin to Stowe. We rent Golden Eagle Resort. It's a little bit more money, but um, we get a much nicer facility, and uh, uh, we've still kept a, a large clientele. Programs. Um, I guess I'll go back to early 2021. We ran Rep Academy, right, to supplement the days that the kids were out of school. Uh, due to COVID, uh, we, we ran our vacation camp. So during school break, we run a kind of a mini version of summer camp for the kids. Um, and then during the summer, we ran summer camp, as you know, for a little over seven. We ran it for eight weeks, but that last week was very few kids because of uh, our outbreak, um, which in hindsight now is not, not as uh, shocking as it is what's going on today. Um, the Meals came from a grant that we secured. <coughs> the rep department does not, we do not internally provide food, right? It's the senior center um, gets reimbursed from the Department of Agriculture for meals for kids. Uh, they haven't been operating at, at, in their capacity and, and it doesn't seem like it's going to be for the summer as well. Um, so I'll work with Feeding Hunger Vermont to try to get a backup plan in place. Um, but. Uh, ultimately, we do not pay for food. It's always been you either bring your lunch or we have this other option. And, and we always try to do our due diligence to make sure we have that option. Um, so this summer we had the grant. Um, then we had a hiking and fishing camp. And uh, that was I mean, incredibly popular. Um, because of COVID, we, we took the kids separate locations throughout the, like two bands, we did different locations so they weren't all together in case one band got exposed. It was right after our outbreak, so we were just being extra cautious. Um, it was successful. And then we opened up uh, after school rec. And um, I mean, yeah, rec is, is busy. Every day it's busy. I was with the kids earlier today. Um, it's an everyday thing now. So uh, we still have lessons on Sunday. Uh, and then we have events usually scheduled for Saturdays. Um, typically work seven days a week. I did this last week. So um, Moving on, last week, last year for parks, we paved Anderson's parking lot. We added a youth basketball court um, in front of the rec building. We're getting a lot of use of the basketball court at Anderson. Um, so that was kind of to uh, alleviate some of the pressure on that court. Um, we did a bunch of field work down here at Dak Road to the fields that had some dangerous slips on them and, uh, and, and scabbing so the, to reclaim the infield. Bought some vans, as you guys know. Um, I spent a whole week patching and painting the pool. Uh, it's an experience. Um, I'm hoping that we'll have minor patches this year because of it. Um, and then we restruct we kind of restructured Anderson, Celia and I. Um, we added some big rocks so cars can't drive in the field and two access gates uh, that Waterbury Ambulance and Gary have the, the code to in case for some reason there's a medical issue at the tennis courts. But um, that's to prevent cars from going out in the fields and doing donuts that have typically happened at least once or twice during my time here. Um, it was open for the Christmas tree burn and got a report the next day that some some kid was doing donuts on the ice. So now it's closed because Christmas tree burn's done, but it just shows you it's open for you know two weeks and someone found their way in. Um, that pretty much sums up 2021 for Rec. Uh, so any questions before I move on to 2020? Great. Um, in the pool, there isn't anything really notable for change. Um, I'm asking less for pay than I did in 2021. Um, you'll see we spent way less, which I explained before. I'm hoping that we'll be back up to, um, you know, you can't always count on the staff to always work the extra hours that you need them to, so I'm hoping that uh, we can get a few more lifeguards again this year. Bill and I have up to pay, the starting pay for that position as, as what's been happening across uh, small businesses and, and, and you know just the overall economy the wage weight is wage weight is going up it's more competitive you can go flip burgers at mcdonald's for more than you can pay for a lifeguard so we're trying to be more competitive in that and sense the minimum wage is going up yeah minimum yeah. wage went up almost a whole dollar 
um, this year. So, um, outside of that, there isn't anything notable for increases. I mean, Bill added a line for programs. It's $3,600. That's our fee we have to pay for three sessions of off-season swim lessons. We recuperate that um, if you micromanage it um, with our swim lesson fees that we charge for those lessons. Uh, so to be clear for the board, there's a decrease in that cost of tax payer for pool. Yep. Yeah, you'll see on one of the few probably departments that I feel like I'm asking less of taxpayers, I'm not asking for an increase for an operating budget. Um, for rec programs, the most notable additions, first off, is a full-time program coordinator. I, I know Bill's mentioned it, I mentioned it, but in order to sustain this, this, growth, this growth that we've, um, that we've kind of established, we're gonna need another full-time person. Thankfully, I've been able to budget it where this person is basically funded by the revenue. Um, they, they will handle kind of the <laughs> programs that I've already established. They're gonna kind of take over more of the in-person um, offering, so I don't have to, you know, work from 7 a.m. to 2.30 here and then go cover rec until 6.30 p.m. every night. Um, and, and then uh, after they're on their feet, the, the goal is that they'll add even more programs that will generate revenue. So it's a win-win. And just to be clear, that 33.455 starts June 1st. So that's not a full year's work. Uh, the sorry, the twenty four thousand will start June folks. Thirty three forty five four fifty five. I mean that's deep. the difference. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Drop down two lines. Yeah. Program four and Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. twenty four thousand starts June first. That's right. Sorry about that. That's, the program pay that number he just said is is the sports staff we need to run right. mini camps. Anything that's not summer camp. So after school hiking and fishing, um, the vacation camps. Uh, basically, any of the other programs that we need and to run. All that's covered by fees. So yeah, I apologize. Do you think you reasonably can expect to hire someone for that twenty-four thousand? Well, again, that's for just seven months. So I understand that. Yeah, yeah. it's a uh, no. It's a full-time full position. Full -time position. It's just fun to see. So if you go the next yeah. year, it's going to be. Yeah. Like, oh, it's. So it's a full-time year-round position. It's budgeted around forty, forty-two thousand, forty-five thousand dollars. Okay. It's in the, it's in the range for a program coordinator. This is for someone who's, um, you know, getting out of college or maybe you know has more time. There, it's a really good position. And then there's growth, right? So if they generate more revenue, and and whatnot, obviously Bill, whoever the next Bill is, will will and I will negotiate what we would want to pay them. But to start, this is this is what the going rate is for motivator. There, a bit of a motivator. Right? Exactly. That's what I mean. That's, that's how I got my, you know, how I got Bill to give me increases. So, um, there really isn't anything else notable besides the mini camps line, which is the correlating line to the program pay. It's, it used to be called mini camp pay, but um, in order to run after school in those mini camps, um, there's supplies we need, right? Arts, crafts, um, yeah. yeah. Fuel. I put everything into the for the after school field trips into there, hiking and fishing, etc. Um, and so that's the that's the projected cost to run uh, non summer camp programs for the year. Right. In the old days, uh, for those of you who might remember, um, the the program pay line at the top, that uh, one twenty point oh one program pay, that used to say mini camp pay. Uh, that was for people that were our employees that we paid to do mini camp stuff. And then the one further down that's still there that says mini camps, that used to be what we paid contractors, but that situation is not that way anymore. This, this 10350 that is budgeted is, is really to provide supplies, materials, right. goods, and everything else that we need to run those programs. For, for an example, I put together a curriculum that, like, you know, Mondays are short stories and something days, Tuesdays are science days, Wednesdays are, are um, you know, are, are, um, game days. So each day, like, I have to have some sort of activity lined up in, in the science one, for instance, we need materials to make a volcano. So um, it's a really good curriculum. It's a really well-budgeted one. This is, again, covered by the fees I've, I've structured. Um, Micro structured this program to generate revenue um, that covers the cost 
there's nothing else notable that I want to mention in programs or that, that sticks out. The other stuff is just correlating to the increase in um, you know, the program coordinator pay and whatnot. You'll see that I've asked for programs. Yeah, it's 1965, um, 9, 19,655 in 2021. I'm asking less, five, uh, about a little over $5,000 for programs. And that's if this new program coordinator runs programs as is, as I've designed them. Hopefully, they'll have you know, more of a capacity just to focus on programs and be able to generate even more. I have a list of ideas. I'm hoping they come with more. Um, I just don't have the time to implement everything. Um, Certainly. I'm going to let Bill talk. You want to go ahead. Well, I just have a, I, I want to you clarify. You may have touched on it when you started. But in rec programs, uh, in the programs line down below, mm -hmm. um, we budgeted five, we spent almost 49, and we're budgeting five. So what? Yeah, that was the, the Albertsons grant. Um, that was for the food, right? Yeah, so that's what we spent on food. Uh, that program line isn't always spent for food. 3,500 of that typically is what we take our, our rental fee out. This year I had it come out of a different line because I wanted that to accurately reflect, reflect the food that we got from the Albertsons line. Um, but yeah, that's, that would be the... So that's not happening as... Uh, as of now, that was, now. right, that was a last minute. Yeah. And we'll come here and talk about it again if I stumble and, upon $60,000. that was dollars. the one that Nick used the grant money to provide food for the kids, but also used it to buy food from local restaurants, which was a kind of a symbiotic <coughs> relationship. Right? Yeah. yeah, and but now I have a lot of favors in restaurants. I'm planning to do that. <laughs> so. Uh, Bill, do you want to speak to my admin? Do I? Uh, go through the rest of your budget and I'll go back. Um, I think Bill and I carried over what we did in 2020 when we cut way back. Um, so we might have accidentally, without really thinking too much, uh, didn't budget enough for uh, help. Uh, there was an additional staff person that came on last minute as well. Um, that was kind of doing a bunch of other things. Um, and so that would explain the, the kind of drastic increase in, in that part-time pay line. Bill and I budgeted what we think is accurate for the, um, and Celia and I, I budgeted what we think is accurate for the uh, 2022 summer. Um, and then I've just asked for a little bit more money for new equipment um, because Celia and I scaled back on um, some improvements to the parks we usually have to replace temporary fencing. We can't put permanent fencing out here because it floods. And um, you know, I learned when I first got here why, because you know, logs have come and taken out the mesh fence before, and that's expensive. So uh, we put in semi-permanent fencing where you put an anchor in and, and put it up around. You've probably seen it. Um, so then I pushed back from 2020 that we had planned, and then again last year uh, and got by with our our other fence, but it's it's definitely taken a beating. So. Um, that's primarily why there's a, a little bit of an increase in there, um, but it's 750 bucks. Um, besides that, I don't have anything else notable for parks. So the reg administration uh, budget, um, the yellow highlight at the bottom to the to capital fund. Right now, that's a placeholder. Ten thousand dollars is what we sent to the reg capital fund last year. Um, we're still in the process of putting together the CIP budget uh, for the parks. One of the wild cards, if you will, is that uh, we've, <coughs> we've got the Red Committee who's been dealing with and working on the uh, Hope Davy Park situation with uh, this golf and uh, conflicts between the users there and other members of the public. Uh, we've talked, the rec committee has talked and spent a lot of time uh, with uh, uh, public input uh, to, to try to come up with maybe doing some type of um, land use planning, park planning, master planning, what, what have you. Uh, Nick has worked with the Red Committee, and right now there's a $35,000 ask. I, I'm not presenting that ask tonight, but I'm, I'm just letting you know why that capital fund line is a little bit uh, uh, nebulous right now. 
Um, I think doing that work, uh, I think developing the scope of what we're going to ask a consultant, because it's going to have to be done by somebody outside. We don't have uh, the, the expertise or the time, frankly, to do it in-house. Um, there's issues there with regard to wetlands and other um, natural areas that uh, when, when the, this golf course was first allowed to be established, none of that was taken into consideration. So uh, there's likely some spending. I think it should happen. Uh, we'll talk more about that in detail when we review the, the uh, CIP budgets. There's also talk about doing some master planning down at the ice center site, which currently is not town land, but I think in the near future, either through the transfer that EFUD was talking about, or better yet, through a, a merger where the town ends up taking over all the assets, uh, we've got a, a, a lot of uh, recreation programming going on down there right now. And you've got this group that wants to develop a skate park down there. Um, and if you're going to do that, you're going to have to do a, a master plan there. So there's some things that are a little bit uh, not finalized yet. So that two capital fund line right now is really just a placeholder, uh, how much money we need to spend. And, and then in relation to other capital expenditures, we'll have to massage that and see what we can do. But uh, those two things are things I think need to happen. Uh, whether the board thinks they need to happen both at the same time, at the same year, that's something we can discuss. Um, real, real quick, there was an application for a grant for some of that. Yeah, it didn't get it. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, that was that VORAC grant that the second year in a row we tried for funding and haven't been successful yet. Um, and I guess they've kind of indicated they're not looking to do planning, they're looking to do implementation. Stuff, right? The vote right? Yeah, right. They're not, they weren't, but our application wasn't as strong as others based on what they're But if for. we did the planning work and then approached them in a subsequent year with an actual budget for a plan, and this is the implementation cost and the, the actual guts of the work. <coughs> That's where they would be more interested. Sure, yeah. If this could segue into a, right, then right. we'd be in a better position to secure well, those we, funds. We tried for some right. actual infrastructure improvements the last, not last year, but, but the year before, ago. right? Uh, was there tennis lighting or something? Yeah, something, well, something with water. Yeah, I'll have to dig yeah. it up. So, anyway, uh, we can continue to try, but we haven't been successful yet. Um, the recreation administration budget really is what it takes to run, um, to, to have the direct director. Uh, most of the expense is in the first five line items up at the top, or six line items, uh, all having to do with personnel. Uh, the rest of it is you know, telephone, uh, some insurances, a little bit of building maintenance uh, for, the, for that building over there. Um, I'm proposing, and I put this in the memo, that, that uh, I'd like to add some duties to Nick's portfolio. I think that if we hire the program coordinator that he talked about, that will free him up a little bit uh, to do some things that I think uh, are unnecessary to be transitioned away from me and Barb Farr. Uh, Barb is gone now, so somebody's got to do some of the things that she was doing. Grant administration, for, for one thing, is uh, very important work that needs to, needs to happen on an annual basis. Um, but we've got this ARPA money that's coming in. We've already received uh, over $700,000 of it. We're going to get another $700,000 sometime in the next couple of months. Um, there's all kinds of reporting that has to happen, record keeping that has to happen. Uh, we're not going to spend 
and even near all of it, if any of it, in 2022. Uh, I'm, I've already recommended that we transfer 600,000 to EFA, but the remainder of the money uh, likely will not be spent in 2022. Maybe some of it will, but the vast majority of it is going to be carried forward. Uh, and uh, we have until uh, 2024, I believe, to obligate the money and 2026 before we have to spend it. Um, and I have been designated as the, uh, for lack of a better term, what's the term I'm looking for? It's not the responsible party, the uh, primary. Anyway, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the one designated by the town right now to, to take care of this money. And I think maybe Carla is uh, the second in, in line. But, um, you know, I'm going to be transitioning out this year. And I think with Nick's experience and education, frankly, now that he's received a master's degree and a doctorate degree in this time that he's been here, and uh, a significant portion of that portfolio is financial management. And he's got the skill set, I believe, to be able to take care of all of the nuts and bolts reporting requirements. You remember those things, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, so <coughs> I've got some of Nick's pay here in the Recreation Director's budget. Uh, we don't have the general government budget in front of us this week. I'm going to add some money to what I showed you last week there. Still going to be less than Barr was making, but I think it's important that for two things. It's important that the town is in a position to transition smoothly forward, and you're going to need somebody to be able to handle uh, just this ARPA fund alone. Uh, and then, uh, you know, giving Nick uh, some additional compensation and some additional duties helps keep Waterbury an interesting place for the guy. I don't want him to be heading down to uh, East Timbuk to be, you know, the town manager or town administrator in one of those communities. Um, the other thing I think that would be helpful is we talked about that position last week, uh, the, the position to deal with the parking that Gary talked about, to talk about, you know, we talked about maybe having the person ability to do some policing in the, in the parks. And when I say policing, I don't mean as a police officer, but uh, to deal uh, with uh, people who are in, in the parks um, and the uh, animal control officer and the, uh, and the health officer duties. And I think that uh, my plan would be that uh, that person, if, it's, if that person's hired, uh, to have Nick supervise that person directly. You know, obviously the town manager would be right in the chain of command, but uh, uh, a significant portion of that portfolio has to do with parking and recreation facilities. So I think that makes sense. So I'm not asking you again to approve all this tonight. I know that we're only in the second week. My hope is that, uh, well, first I'll stop there and see if you have any questions about anything that I just said. Okay. You laid it out well. So my hope is that next Monday we're going to talk with Celia about the highway budget and the uh, highway CIP stuff. Um, Steve will be here to talk about the planning budget. I had a meeting with the library commissioners at 5 this afternoon. Their budget was pretty much done. So even though we will not have approved or even talked about the highway budget and the planning budget next week, my plan is, in addition to reviewing those two budgets next week with those two department heads, that I'll have enough information and I'll put everything that we've talked about in 
and I think I'll have a preliminary bottom line, if you will, uh, and then on, uh, you know, we'll we'll see where we are at that point, and then if you think that it's not doable, then we'll cut back on the 24th. If everything is looking good next week, maybe on the 24th I'll fine tune everything and we can adopt everything on the 24th and maybe not have to meet on the 31st. But if what I present to you next week kind of as a whole, assuming that we go for what I present as a highway budget and as a planning budget, um, if if that's too much when we're at the end of next week's meeting, then I'll bring something different back on the 24th and then have to finalize it on the 31st. So I think we're making progress. I think we're still in a pretty good place right now. Um, there is one thing I just realized last week, um, and I feel badly uh, because I didn't really read the letter. I've had on my desk uh, since October, a uh, letter from the ambulance service. And I read it last week and said, oh, they're asking for, a, you know, the, the, uh, going from $39,000 to something over $50,000 for the appropriation. When I read it two weeks ago, uh, when I read it two months ago, when I, when I first got it, I thought that they were kind of saying, well, that's, well, it was in-kind contribution because we own the building and we provide the dispatching for them. But uh, they've had significant cost overruns, as you can imagine, given COVID the last two years. So there's a significant increase in actual cash uh, for that line item, and uh, I'll plug that in next week. I've sent an email to my Podgeway to ask a few questions. Uh, he hasn't responded yet. Aren't there COVID funds to pay for some of that stuff? Um, I don't know. I assume so. But I, I would assume so, because that's what we're doing this whole thing is, you know, testing and vaccination. You know, you would think that would be the key thing that we'd have money for. Yeah. What was that? Is the ARPA money supposed to be for any of those? That's what I was going to say. No. No, not no. ARPA. But ARPA, there was, ARPA is not for operations. That's more infrastructure and, and uh, yeah. so but, anyway, but uh, there's COVID money that was for operational costs. So I don't have the answers yet to that, but I'll hopefully get it by next week. Because I understand they probably had this year, you know, you know, we've gone for testing a whole bunch of times whenever we, you know, go someplace, you know, we get tested. I understand they're probably having a lot more people, you know, they're, they're open all the time. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's an increased cost, but I, I think that's a one time, well, let's hope it's, you know, this year, last year, this year, and, and not continuing. Let's hope this, we're gonna be out of this pandemic at some point. Anything else for Nick so we can let him go? Good job, Nick. Thank you. Your programs are running well, and we're very appreciated seeing something with a lower cost. Yes, no, thank you. I do have one more. I know everyone's running over. It's one more important thing to say. This is likely the last time I present a budget with Bill, um, and so I mean, I think you look at the budget, the operating budget, expense side is yeah, almost half a million dollars. It's a little over thousand dollars shy of a half a million dollars. When I first started, it was in the high 200, 300 range. So we've increased um, the, you know, this department substantially while almost every year asking less from uh, taxpayers. And as much as you know, that's me driving it and having all these ideas and getting creative, I would not uh, be able to do that without Bill uh, not stonewalling me every five seconds. You know, I may get arguments, I may get yelling matches, it certainly happened over the past couple weeks, but I, I personally and professionally would not be where I'm at today uh, to be able to, you know, be successful in this role or if I do go somewhere else and be successful in municipal government uh, without Bill. So because it's our last meeting, I also want to give him, you know, a ton of credit for, for how far the rec department has come. Um, 
in such a short time. So thanks, Bill. And thank you guys. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Yeah. So we're um, at quarter ten. Um, I had letter C there, which is to, you asked about it last week. I want to talk about it a little bit. Um, just to ask the town select board's reaction to some of what I talked about back in December when I talked about the, uh, you know, this of money. Um, and giving some of it to EFUD and having EFUD turn over and exchange its revolving loan funds. And that first idea kind of morphed into, I really think the auto moved towards uh, merging at all costs. Should he sit in on this conversation or is it not necessary? Um, either way, I mean, it's this late already. I'll say. I think I'm actually going to No. Mm. Your insight into preparation in general and the direction that this could head, you know, ultimately. So I, I tuned you out for the last two minutes. So what, okay. what topic did we go, what did we swing into? Well, I want Mark to come back. But yeah. what we're talking about now is the night that I told everybody that I was going to retire. Mm -hmm. I prefaced that with the presentation about how I believe the town should uh, transfer, appropriate $600,000 of its ARPA money to EFA to allow EFA to deal with a private water system that they provide water to up at the New Flats Trailer Park. Uh, it's a substandard system, and it should be in complete public ownership. And this is a good way to do it because you can't use our money for traditional uh, infrastructure that the select board is usually interested in, which is roads and bridges right. and that kind of stuff. There's other infrastructure money that's going to be coming down. We will be able to use some of that for uh, that traditional infrastructure because you can calculate lost revenue and the amount of lost revenue that you can prove that you have, you can reappropriate that uh, or you can appropriate that in the regular budgeting process. So there may be some of that ARPA money that we can use just to get into the you know infrastructure CIP or the paving CIP or the vehicle CIPs, what have you. But the bulk of it, uh, we're going to have to uh, you know, be a little bit creative. So $600,000 to EFA so that they can deal with the water system at the Peck Mobile Home Park. And if that, uh, if the cost of that, I don't have a firm estimate on that yet. But even if the cost of that is a little less, there's more improvements that need to be done up on Route 100. There's a one-inch line that comes down from Howard Avenue down to the, uh, where the, uh, what is it, Sunflower? Uh, the natural, natural foods yeah. over there. So there's only a one-inch line that comes down there. Um, I have computers right across the street. They're a customer of ours. They're going to be growing. It would be good to have a, 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 an 8 inch water main with hybrids there and everything else. So even if the $600,000 is, is too much for the Tech Mobile Home Park, there's other stuff up there that, that he thought uh, could do. <coughs> uh, so that gets something for EFA. And, um, you know, you guys, I mean, the bottom line is that there should be one government in Florida. Uh, EFLUD, their only portfolio right now really is operating water and sewer system. They happen to have an involving loan fund that's a vestige of the old village of Waterbury. Um, but 
decisions about where water and sewer service is going to be provided in this community, um, where the sewer lines are going to go, if you're going to provide sewer anywhere other than in the existing EFUD district. It shouldn't be EFUD making those decisions. It should be the, the town. Um, uh, you know, do we put sewer line up room 100 to, you know, be on a couple of road? Um, you know, I had visions at one point, uh, you know, it's already in the village, it's already in the EFUD district, the uh, country called of Vermont, not trying to make them go out of business, but if they ever decided that that wasn't a good use of their uh, land anymore, if they wanted to get out of the golf business, that's one area that you could uh, pretty much have a gravity sewer flow from there if you need a pump station. But I guess that's already, it's all in conservation land, so that's not developable for the housing. Never say never. But anyway, uh, so where water and sewer goes uh, really should be a decision the whole town makes, not just EFUD. Um, EFUD and the town select board have already talked about EFUD transferring to the town properties, EFUD homes that are not used for water and sewer. We've talked about the ice center, we've talked about the park park. Um, if you're going to do that, you might as well take it off, own, own everything. Um, and uh, I think you'd be in a, in a much better position than, than you are now. But in the short term, uh, I think that, you know, um, the trade should be right off the bat uh, in exchange for the $600,000 that EFUD would give, I mean, that the town would give to EFUD for the, the water system improvement. The quid pro quo should be turn over the revolving loan fund for the town, to the town and allow the town select board to be the ones deciding whether this um, almost million dollar portfolio of assets and cash and investments that EFUD has, should it be used to continue to lend to, to businesses, which businesses? Right now, all the businesses that get loans are in EFUD. You can't get a loan if you're up in the Waterbury Center. So if they don't need it, but if Ivy Computer or um, MPX needed a loan to help incentivize themselves to get here, EFUD could do it now because both of them are water customers. But if they were not on the water system, EFUD would have no ability to give them a loan. So we wanted to build something down uh, Route 2 beyond uh, you know, the sewer plant. If I couldn't give them a loan. Um, we talked about housing. You know, it's a huge issue for the town. Um, and, and wouldn't it be nice to have a revolving loan fund of several hundred thousand dollars that you could incentivize housing with? Uh, so I think it makes sense all the way around. I don't see any downside to, to doing this. And if the if the biggest the bigger step was taken uh, trying to merge, I, I see only positives out of that. Uh, you know, for for 35 years almost, you know, I've dealt with two municipalities. Um, I got rid of uh, two meetings a month when EFR consolidated and did away with their board of trustees. I used to have two trustees meetings a month and one water sewer commissioners meeting a month. Now I have one water sewer commissioners meeting a month. The fact that they moved their annual meeting to May makes budget time so much more pleasant for me. I mean, it's still a lot of work, but I don't have to have a town budget and a village budget, a full service village budget, all done in January, like I did it until 2018. Um, so, you know, there's still, however, an elected library commission that I 
go to all the meetings. I go to the London Cemetery Commission meetings. I've got the refund meetings, and I've got your meetings. So there's four boards of five individuals, and I staff all those meetings. If you merge, one of those boards could go away, or I, I would think you'd still want to have a water sewer commission. Whether they need to be elected or not, I don't know. But you'd probably want to appoint people who have the background that Skip Flanders and Bob Panukin have, you know, engineers who know something about how those systems work. But the select board would have some control over that. Right now, we don't have any control over anything that they do or <coughs> they do. I just don't think that's good for the town in the long run. So anyway, that's... So maybe I'm misunderstanding you here. Um, are you suggesting, and I don't believe I, that this is your suggestion, but are you suggesting that, suggesting that over time the town is going <coughs> to no, absorb the water and sewer, the EFA district itself, the, the water and sewer department? Yeah. Yeah. Just so like this is, this is new from, and this kind of veers completely off, I think, <coughs> what our conversation about this was supposed to be. No. Because you were going to take the, the, what do you call the money there that we're getting from the feds? ARPA. ARPA. You were going to take that and you were going to use it as a care for the water department and sewer department to put water in <coughs> up at the trailer park in exchange for, the, for their, uh, their fund the almost million dollars, and then you were going to suggest that we take a portion of that and I won't, you know, I don't mean this in a negative term, but bail out to the ice center uh, by doing some repairs, some restructuring, you know, refinancing. Well, I was, I was, you no. Know, and I thought that's what this conversation was, was about. I didn't. Well, that's that was part of it. Okay, because from last time we talked, I, I don't recall any discussion about. I mean, and I'm, I'm elated to hear that because you know back a while ago at one of our joint meetings when we, Skip and I got into it there and quite a heated exchange about when I suggested merger but never really merger, you were going to take the, the, the village was going to take the gravy and leave us with a bag of crap. And I said, merger to me means all in. And now you're suggesting that that's a possibility. Yeah, and I, and I'd love to see that. This is exactly the same. That's what that last the, the memo yeah. that, It's exactly the same. The memo that I But I thought it was just to take their investment funds. It wasn't no, to no, take no, no. Chris, oh. here's the memo. Yeah. That I, this is the memo that I read that night. And I said right here, I've worked in Waterford for 34 years. We've taken big strides to consolidate governments. I still work for two governmental entities, four elected boards. That's a story for another time. But through the use of, e of the ARPA funds coming our way, the recently passed infrastructure, I believe it is time for the town of EFA to begin to take steps to merge. So that's what I thought. I only thought it was the investment, the no. investment portfolio no. here. No. When we were going to over and they would still keep the sewer and no, so my, I mean my mistake. And, so, and I'm so glad to hear it's otherwise. So, in the in the short term, I mean the merger the merger is going to take the merger can't happen until the earliest the merger could happen would be January of 2023, and frankly, realistically, not until July of 2023. Because first of all, you're going to have to go through and have a merger vote. You still need to do that in both communities. And then the merger, well, you got to write the merger document first. Vote on that in both communities. It's got to pass in both communities. It's got to survive <coughs> a, a petition challenge. There shouldn't be any because there's no taxing implications anymore. It was all those years in the past, the town always said no because taxes were going to go up. There's no taxes anymore. But the big thing is that once it passes, then you've got to send it to Montpelier to the legislature, and they'll introduce it next January. And the 
earliest that they'll be able to, you know, pass maybe in 2023, and the governor signs it, and maybe as of July 1st, 2023, you could be merged, or maybe you decide to wait, have the merger take effect January 1st, 2024, if you uh, are going to stay on a a calendar year budget. But. And then, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the other interesting part of this balance sheet scenario is we would be taking $600,000 of ARPA money, buying something that I would say arguably has assets well in excess of $600,000. And then that $600,000 is now, you'd be, you, there'd be a plan for the use of those funds, but it really is, it's not like the $600,000 left the greater merged entity that now uses that to invest in the trailer park project or whatever else. So really like it's a it's an interesting scenario. Right. I I would recommend that I would like to think that in our twenty twenty two budget we can have in there a six hundred thousand dollar appropriation to E fund. Give them the money so that they have it and they can begin dealing with the Pac Mobile Home Park. Right after that, is, if that appropriation happens and we pay that, EFUD will transfer the in May at their annual meeting. So your town meeting is going to be in March. You approve the six hundred thousand dollars to EFUD. It goes through. It survives the the petition challenge. And then at the EFUD meeting in May, they would put on their budget that, um, I mean, on their warning that they're going to transfer the loan fund to you right there. So that's the first transaction. If this board and the EFUD board is up for it, I would, you can put an article on the warning for March meeting to say, to ask the voters to give you the authority to establish a committee to work on merger and start that, potentially you could have that merger document written so it could be elected, voted on at the November elections, and then it passes, you gotta wait the 30 days, and then January 1st rolls around and you hand your New charter to the to the uh, to the legislature, and you know, uh, so it's ambitious, but it's all doable. We we've written merger documents in the past when it was a much more complicated merger to deal with. How are we going to deal with the police department? How are we going to deal with the fire departments? How are we going to you know all that <coughs> stuff has been taken care of now. It's really governance. Now that you're talking about, the town of Waterbury shall have the authority to have all the things allowed by the general government, going to take over EFUD's water, <coughs> water and sewer system, take over all of these EFUD's assets. All of that goes, EFUD just goes away, and you're left with the town of Waterbury that has a full service municipality, <coughs> no more tax burden than it has now. Uh, uh, water and sewer system, both of which have significant assets, not only in the ground, but in the bank. Um, and, and then you have lots of resources to do things that I think the community needs to address over, over time. Uh, and the housing stuff is right there. We talked about local option taxes earlier, Chris, today. You could put right in the right in your merger document, which would be the charter for the new for the town government. You could put right in there the authority to have a local option tax, with the caveat that you don't get to implement it until the voters authorize you to you know to impose the tax. But at least you'd have the ability to have it uh, because we don't have the ability to have it right now. So can we put the connection, or is that kind of off the table at this time with the ICE Center? Because that was my bigger concern about this conversation. Well, the ICE that Center, was that I was headed. All right, so that's, that's why I initially asked. So, so the ICE Center, let's, 
I did say in this memo that I would, I would ask you to appropriate $100,000 and give it to the ISA uh, this year. And whether that's our money or ARPA money, um, you know, you can move things around under a, a shell all you want. Um, I believe that they are an entity that could, uh, you could appropriate ARPA money to them uh, as long as they used it for an eligible purpose. Uh, when I wrote the memo, my idea was we've got a significant uh, cash balance right now that we talked about last week from all of the excess revenue that we had uh, unanticipated last year and lower spending. Let's just make it simple. Let's just uh, appropriate $100,000 of our money, not tied to ARPA. That way they don't have any strings. They don't have to worry about um, um, you know, justifying how they used it. The reason I'm recommending this, Chris, is that to me, it, it strengthens the ICE Center and it gives them uh, much more ability to continue on operating as they do and not be taken over by the town. If, if, if we fail to help the ICE Center, I think what's eventually going to happen, you've got a handful of people down there that have been doing that work for 20 years, 17 years since they've opened and three years before they opened to try to fundraise for that. Um, and COVID has done a number on their uh, cash reserves. And for a not-for-profit not, not organization to pay all their bills, to operate that center, pay all their mortgages, and have the ability to have built up a reserve of $150,000 before COVID struck. I think they're doing things pretty good. They get no assistance except for the road that was built down there and the water and sewer lines that were put down there by the community. There hasn't been any payment. There's been, we've given a break on taxes. I'll grant you that. But there's never been an appropriation of $32,000 like we were going to give to the Senior Citizen Center or to, you know, uh, $75,000 plus to revitalizing Waterbury or uh, any of those other special articles. They've never come and asked us for anything. So I think if you do that, if you give them the $100,000 that they can put back in their reserve fund and then use it Zambonis need to be replaced. Um, you know, their building is getting old. They need to do building maintenance. You give them that money, I think they have a reasonable chance to continue operating as they do. And if they do a lot of business. Including paying their debt in the model they're currently carrying. Yeah. Out. Yeah. So, <coughs> so now I did also recommend that IFA. <coughs> Um, restructure their debt. They owe $500,000, $530,000 to IFA. And I would recommend that IFA, I was going to recommend that they forgive that debt, but then I had second thoughts and I said, no, we should, we should convert that to a 20-year term uh, with a balloon payment at the end that could be negotiated at the end. And the reason I suggested that is just like we did with the uh, EFA did with the Stimson Graves building. You know, they had a $500,000 loan to the Stimson Graves building, and they forgave it. Interest and principal all was forgiven. Uh, and they also, that was a CDBG grant that was granted to the village, and then they lent it into that program. And it had to be lent in those days because of federal rules, tax rules, about people who get tax credits. That, those rules aren't the same anymore. So at the time, we got that, we bought, we got that CBDG grant, and it had to be lent. It couldn't have been granted. But in effect, that's what they did. They said, we're going to give you a 30-year term, and at the end of the term, we're going to forgive it, basically. 
the new dad money, they lent 202000 I think, into this Crimson Grace building. And uh, they, they did ask that to be paid back, but they forgave the interest, about $63,000 worth of interest. And the town did the same thing for the seminary building with the CDBG grant that came in, $336,000 still on our books, but there's no expectation that's ever going to be paid. And when 30 years comes, they'll come into town, and the expectation is that the town is going to say, yeah, that wasn't our money in the first place. It was a grant. We linked it into the project because we had to, and it just goes away. Uh, the reason why I decided that I shouldn't just have EFUD forgive the loan and keep it on the books as a loan with a balloon payment after 20 years is in the event that they do go bankrupt, if you forgive the loan, it's gone. If they do go bankrupt and somebody comes in and buys the property, they got to at least negotiate with EFUD for that $500,000 loan. So um, that loan, I, I do believe, should go away. But the loan that the ICE Center had when they started this was uh, half a million dollars from UDAC, uh, UDAC from the village and $800,000 from Community National Bank. So they were at 1.3 million. Now they're down to 800,000. 836,000, 530,000 to EFUD, and 300,000 more or less to, uh, to uh, the, the Community National Bank. So in the 17 years, they've paid their debt. They've never missed a debt payment to EFUD or to the Community National Bank. When COVID struck, for all UDAG borrowers, the e flood commissioners have waived penalty and interest uh, <coughs> just until the pandemic ends, so these businesses can you know, use their money to try to pay help or buy supplies or whatever. They're not having to pay that mortgage. So they haven't had to pay anything for two years now, but before the pandemic, they never missed the payment. And they had paid their UDAG loan down from the original 500000 down into the $300,000 range. And the reason why it's back up to five hundred thirty dollars now is because I told the 85 commissioners, if you want to protect your loan, what you ought to do is loan them more money so they can buy down their community national loan. Community nationals got them for a 6.5% interest rate. So, we lent them a couple hundred thousand dollars more. They were able to work out with the Community National Bank. They wouldn't lower the interest rate, but they said, well, if you pay $200,000 down on your loan, we'll, we'll re-amortize it over the number of years that you have left by giving them immediate credit. Because if you, know, if you make a, an extra $2,000 payment on your mortgage, you still have to make your $800 mortgage payment every month. So uh, that way they got $500,000 still into e fund so that they could pay that community national <coughs> down and, and you know, pay a lesser interest rate. So my goal with, with giving um, the ICE Center this money is to try to allow them to continue to operate on their current business model because if the worst case scenario happens and they can't pay their bills, they can't pay their mortgage. Community National Bank's not going to want to run a, a, an ice rink. They're going to turn to the village and they're going to say, well, <coughs> they owe us 300000 they owe you 500000 Maybe the village says to the Community National Bank, you know, cancel the debt, we'll, we'll take over or we'll buy, you know, pay you a 50 cents on the dollar for it. They've got to a guarantee from rural development. So if they failed on that debt, uh, Community National would actually get 90% of the $330,000 right. that they owe. So if it all happened, if the worst case scenario happens, who's going to be operating that ice set? It's going to be the village of Watery right now, because either that or they're going to sell it to get their money back. <coughs> but then we don't have a nice set in the community. And I think they've proven in the 17 years that they've operated that, that 
they can do it and that the community wants it. Don't you just want to have an ice center in, in your portfolio? Yeah. I mean, I was, I and Katie were all liaisons on the board for a bit. Um, I mean, definitely the town could run it more efficiently, but it would be kind of a scenario like the pool, not as drastic as far as losing money. Uh, in that sense, we'd be creative, but it, it would be a headache. I don't, headache. I don't think it would have to be a losing proposition. For 17 years, they paid every bill that they had, right. and they put it. They built up a reserve fund of over $150,000. So if they can do that, and our expenses would be less, I guarantee you, well, they probably don't pay anybody health insurance down there. I don't know if they, probably if they do or not. But um, the liability insurance would be certainly a lot lower if we had it, because we'd be able to insure the capacity. the town umbrella. But um, you know, I'm not angling to have the town take that over. I'd like to have them continue to operate just as they are. And I think if you give them a little bit of help, um, that can happen. So are you currently saying that they, they right now they have 150,000 uh, in no. reserve, 150,000 in reserve? I don't think they have quite that now because they've had the dip in through COVID. So it's going, it's going down. So the reason I ask you to stay because you know, I appreciate the Ice Center for what it is, but it's always been a rub for me because I remember back years ago when they came in front of the, the town meeting, people at town meeting, to propose the Ice Center and swore they'd never be a burden to the town. And, you know, I guess I have a different perspective or different line of sight with this thing that it, it, it's been my opinion and Apparently you're proving me wrong here tonight. I mean, when you, whenever you have to subsidize any business in any form, it's running it, it's running in the black, um, in the red. In the red. Um, so what's the subsidy? Well, I mean, the, you just suggested that some of the things that the town did for for them to with the road and the, and the other utilities. Um, plus the tax breaks that we've given them over the years. Um, in my eyes, they've always seemed like they've struggled. They can't even finish the inside of the building because they haven't had sufficient funds to do it, apparently. Or for whatever reason, they haven't finished it. Um, and, you know, uh, as valuable as some people may think that the Ice Center is for the community, others perhaps think the opposite way. <coughs> What happens is when people, you know, come come and create these ideas with this uh, vision of grandeur, and then they run in the red for years, and then by default, you know, it ends up being the municipality's baby. Um, the reason I wanted you to sit here is to to get some idea of whether or not you thought. If the town ended up with that for any reason, that it could be structured in such a way that it could run the way it should right. and, and be cost effective. And so, yeah. So before, before he answers, I'm going to argue with your premise a little bit that I don't think that they're running in the red. Now, if you want to, you know, the, the town, the town uh, paved over a, a, a car path that went down to the. Uh, you know, old town dump that was down. So that's what the town, the town put $90,000 in, into that. So if you divide $90,000 into 17, I can't do it in my head, but you know, it's what, $5,000 a year. Um, that's all the town has put in. Now, yes, uh, we had a deal with them that if they ever became tax exempt, that they would continue to pay um, uh, a payment in lieu of taxes to the town. They did that through 2017, and then in that year, the select board said, well, the village has gone away in 2018. Um, and, and, you know, the education tax went away. We don't have to pay their share of the education tax like we have to for the 100 month child care. So since we don't have to do that, we said, forget it. You don't have to bother you know, your $4,000 tax bill or whatever it was. So we, we 
gave that away. But besides that little bit of a tax appropriation in the road, town hasn't done anything for it. And as I said in my, in, you know, this memo that I wrote, um, the, uh, So between 2003 and 2021, so we paid 90 grand for the road and we, and we gave them a little bit of a tax break. So let's let's double that. Let's say $200,000 that we've given them in, in 20 years, $10,000 a year. I don't think it comes close to that. But from 2003 to 2021, We've appropriated $1.24 million to every other $65,000 a year that we've given to the senior center, to the Center for Independent Living, for what have you is, you know, on, on that special articles list. Um, did they have retired seniors, citizens, volunteers, family center, pro project independent? Did they ever approach the board in years past asking for a special article? Because no. they were able to run into the black, they just didn't. No, because when they when they started the fundraising project, they they told people, we're not we're not gonna ask the town for any money. So they except for the road and the water and sewer. Now they paid allocation fees, they paid $56,000 of allocation fees to get the water and sewer down there. And uh, uh, Skip thought that they paid the village back for the $200,000 worth of water and sewer lines that uh, we built down there, but I don't think they ever paid that back. So even if you add all that together, the $90,000 and the it's three hundred thousand dollars from the community, uh, two hundred thousand of which comes from uh, the water and sewer people, which are not of the full town. So all I'm saying is that with a little bit of help, I think that they can maintain under the current uh, business model that they have, assuming COVID goes away, and they can start selling ice like they they were before. Uh, so I don't see that it's a subsidy. I see that it's a one-time appropriation, give them a lift, and, and hopefully that's an investment so you don't have to take it away. Okay. So that's, that's my feeling. So, uh, and I, I would agree to, to all of that, and I am on board with it. Uh, I mean, Katie's been on this committee here for a while. Um, I mean, if... if I guess what, what I would need to know, and it sounds like they're reluctant to give that information, is um, if, if for some reason they're, they're bleeding uh, in, you know, at the seams in certain areas, and, and unless things get restructured and, and, and set up so that they're feasibly running strong and efficient and effective, which I'm sure they're probably trying to do the best that they can. But if there's areas that they're that they're not where they're bleeding revenues, you know, uh, do we need to have those corrections made before we dump more money into Well uh, I'm not gonna say more money because you haven't built anything. No, no, you don't understand what I'm saying, but throwing money into something that's eventually going to be back to the same position that it's in right now. Well, if corrections in you're, turn, you're basically saying made, if you give them the 100 grand and a couple years later they're in a similar position. You know, yeah, I guess so that's what I'm asking. asking. If you give them the 100 grand and then a couple of years later they, they fail, you're going to you're gonna have, whether it's an asset or, or a liability, it's going to be back in your lap. You're going to own it. And I'm trying to prevent that by saying, should there be some inter internal restructuring that would make them more operate more securely? But, but you haven't convinced me yet that they've been doing anything wrong. I'm not saying that they are. I'm just saying, do do we have the ability to? Look into that. That's cool. well, yes. Yeah, I mean, you can certainly we can I think we do, talk to them about what their challenges are and what their issues are. 
But as I said, from the outside looking in, and I don't, I don't inspect their books. I'm not, you know, there. You know, I don't go to their meetings. I, I talk to them, uh, you know, several times a year. But, but when I look at the fact that without any kind of appropriation from the community, that for the first 17 years that they've operated, that they've been able to pay all their bills and put some money in the bank. That's a whole lot better than most of these organizations that we give money to. You know, with all this federal money coming into the state coffers, I even asked talked to the governor one day on the radio and said, you know, bef before you go dishing this money out to all these departments, don't you think that they should be, the ones that are bleeding at the seams should be restructured so that they're, you know, you're getting the return on investment that you were expecting to get, but aren't for some reason. Uh, and making these programs run efficiently before you start dumping money back in them. Well, otherwise, they're just going to be back in the same place then, when they burn through it. Yeah, and if, what, I, what I will tell you, and I, I don't know this, nobody said this to me, but, you know, talking with Jonathan Siegel and Bob Perrette and Mike Thompson, who've been doing this since, you know, 2000, um, if the town said, look, we'll take over the ice center, we can do it better than you can. They would say, here you go. They would be happy as clams to get rid of it. And I think that, you know, I mean, Stowe has an ice center, and Harry's sitting here, and I know that there was promises made that, uh, that it wasn't gonna cost the taxpayers any money when they transformed the Jackson Arena from what it was into what it is now. I think they are putting tax money into it. So I'm not here making the promise to say if we took it over, it would never cost a cent because there are things that would happen. All the employees would be municipal employees, and we provide health insurance benefits. We have higher employee overhead than they have. So if we can give them a helping hand and keep them doing what they're doing, I think the thing is a benefit to the community in terms of, you know, you just look at the number of uh, just high school hockey games, forget their, their leagues, but you, know, you must have how many games do the girls have a year, in a normal year? Like 15, 15, 18. Is that the whole season? Yeah. So, you know, 10, 9, 8. 8 to 10 here, the boys would have the same amount. So, you know, there's there's 20 games. Those people are, they're coming here, their parents are coming, their grandparents are coming. Uh, I guarantee you that there's a multiplier from the people that come into this ice center that spill over into the businesses in this community. I can't quantify it, but I guarantee it's there. I mean, obviously, Prior to COVID, they were able to make debt service payments on what was originally 1.3 million to what became 800 and change. So that and, 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 and they had they had, a, they had some kind of capital budget of that they built to over six figures. So that would imply that they, under regular circumstances, can function in that space and not be running in the red. So. We had that meeting, we've had subsequent meetings discussing this. Did they approach you and ask for any money? Okay. No. But what they have done is restructured debt to try to figure out how to make things work with their current cash flows by doing what they did with community bank and uh, e-funds <laughs> loan to them, right? Yeah, and, and the reason why so the answer is no. Nobody from the ICE Center came to me and asked me to say any of this. They didn't even know about it until I presented it. They didn't, I didn't invite them to the meeting. I told them afterwards to, to watch it. What I will say is that the, the biggest assistance that they've had through COVID, now they did get some PPP loans so that they could pay their staff and stuff like that. Uh, and I think those would be forgiven. But there's no question that what the, the recommended to the EFI commissioners and what they ultimately did saved their bacon. 
So since March of 2020, they haven't had to make a $2,300 principal and interest payment on the UDAC loan to the village. Now the community national bank said, oh, well, <coughs> we'll suspend your principal and interest payments. You don't have to make them. But we're going to keep the on button on the interest. So if they owe $300,000 and they don't make any payments at 6.5%, you know, they've been going up the roller coaster. So they've been paying the community and national. And they're bank. unable to go to a new lender to become the primary lender on that? They're, they've they've talked, I've been working with them. And, uh, so they're, they're looking around, but the, the uh, interest payment, you know, might go down a couple of percent, you know, which would, which would be helpful, but they're not going to get a 2% loan like they get from e five from any The area. problem, Mark, with ICE arenas all over the state and all over New England, economically, they're, they're difficult. They, you know, to do in any kind of conventional loan. That's why they like, the only reason why Community National Bank did the whole thing is because they had a loan guarantee. They were basically had a 90% guarantee against loss, so they had 10% exposure. The, the problem is that when, when we see with all the ice arenas is that they don't want to charge enough, the hockey's expensive enough, and they don't want to charge enough to, you know, hockey kids have to pay a lot as is, but the true cost of it's a lot more. And that's why these are all these arenas statewide and, and New England wide are having problems. But well, this, this one, one, this one, one, this one has this it. one has it. I mean, it hasn't been. Its annual budget was not being paid by the municipality at right. all, from what I understand. Right. They've been doing pretty been well. Doing something right. 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 And so, since March of 2020, now though, almost two years. They haven't had to pay that twenty-three hundred dollar a month payment. Right. If they had to do that, they'd, they'd be bankrupt. They'd be gone. And, right. You know, they'd be negotiating with refund about do you want to operate a hockey rink or right. do we sell it to be yeah. a warehouse? You know. Is it yours? Or do we have a? Mm. Or do we have a? Uh, Amazon Prime, you know, distribution I mean, center. One of the things that I struggle with right now through this conversation is that you you have to bring the ice center into the conversation, mostly because if you have a revolving loan, the revolving loan fund is the e-fund money, right? So it's represented as a million dollars, but five hundred and thirty of it. No, no, it's one point seven. Okay. So, 1.7. So, you take, okay. you take the 500 out, you're still going to have over you're going to have a million dollars in assets. But, but the conversation here is that I didn't, I personally struggled with even being able to talk through the idea of us having any opinion on, on forgiveness of a loan that we don't currently yeah, hold in our books. And, and I appreciate that now we've changed that conversation from. Let's not talk about forgiveness. Let's just talk about making sure they survive so they can continue to make that yeah, payment. And, and that and debt is still good, work, right, not bad. Right. Yeah, and then the, but I think if um, if if, um, if this deal with the six hundred thousand dollars of ARPA to deal with the home, home parks water system happens, I do think EFUD should restructure the loan for the I seven. So it is. Uh, uh, balloon payment in 20 years, so it's no principal and interest, nothing is expected. EFUD's got the loan fund now, they should make that decision, and when when the loan fund is turned over to the town, that will still be on the balance sheet as $530,000, but there's no anticipation of any payment until 20 years down the road, and then there's Total the balloon comes to. Why not? Why not a why not a hybrid balloon where you still have some kind of payment? So it'd be a thirty-year or sixty-year am or whatever you want to do, but there's still some kind of payment to represent that debt. Well, I don't I don't know why is it different than what was done with the Stimson Grace building? Why is it different from what the town did for the seven-year building? 
$336,000 loan to, to Down Street from the town of Waterbury. It was federal money, just like the Udenic money that came to the village back in 1984 for the Jerry's. It was federal money that came to the village. It's not village tax money. It's been lent out. They've done it for the Stimson Graves building. Uh, the town has done it for the Stimson Graves building, so why not? But that was specific to housing and affordable housing compared to hockey. And that's all about that's all about tax credits too. That's all about housing tax credits. The ice center does does afford a certain amount of community support, and it's an important asset to the community. I do believe that, but I can't necessarily say it's a one for one in conversation with affordable housing and low income housing. I just can't put those two on the same level. I do think that it's important that we. This is something where, I, and I agree, I know that Stowe pays $350,000 a year to, to carry the debt service on a facility they built. That, and they pay for it through local option tax. So, so I don't heard any, at least. Well, that's part of the reason why it's not. But, uh, it's, um, it's a little bit of a luxury versus a necessity. But like, to me, from the conversations that I've heard since the start of the concerns around the COVID, which I do believe that they have, I completely understand how that business can be absolutely affected by this is I think we should definitely talk about ways we can help them and my my question is is, is can we recall meeting with them outside of some of this I know we got to do it if we're going to try to put it up as a line item on on the annual budget for this year but I want to hear it from them of do they need this hundred thousand dollars because if if they say they think they can make it work I don't, I don't, I can't, I just don't see how we can just allocate it. I do want to protect that debt because there's a very good chance we're going to absorb that debt. Um, but to well, me, the, the debt would be on the balance sheet. And um, nobody's suggesting that it, nobody's suggesting that a decision is made today that it never has to be paid back. You don't write that into the loan. When the Stimson Graves owner came back to the village after the 30 years, they came back. The, the, Village trustees could have said, well, let's, you know, you had 30 years of no principal and interest. Uh, how about we turn it into, you know, 10 years? We want $100,000 after 10 years. That's for the board at that time to make the decision on. So I don't think you, I don't think you make the decision on the debt now. You make it so it, if the ICE Center doesn't have to pay that debt and you help them with this $100,000 for their capital equipment fund, you know, the, the debt alone is $2,300 a month that they save. That will make it much easier for them to stay in business as they currently are. Well, I, I still think it's, it's important that we meet with them and for, for everybody's purpose to meet with them and see if there's ways that you know that's in with his mind and the way he works with with recreation and has, has been able to you know bring funding into the picture that we never saw before and, and that's why his budget is so spectacular and he, he's getting me more on board with the whole recreation concept as time goes on which i never was right uh, but to you'll be adding an expansion to the ice center. <laughs> just to suggest or, or help the ice center, if they if there's any places that they can restructure their management and the way they operate to yet further uh, create a more financially stable entity than before we throw them. You know, if if we do. Uh, that just secures our investment even longer and better. I don't yeah. know that I don't know that it's a if, I don't know that we're overreaching if we're going to be offering to put that kind of money. So the big the big thing for them is to continue to be able to move forward without having to pay a twenty three hundred dollar a month debt. They haven't had to pay it for two years now. If E on Wednesday says you know what, we're throwing the switch, 
and the uh, amortization schedule is back on, they got to come up with $2,300 a month that they haven't had to come up with for three years, and they're still in the middle of a pandemic. So that is the brass ring, is restructure that debt so they don't have to pay that, and that puts them on a much better footing for operating purposes. The 100 grand is to simply get some money back in their reserve fund so that if things happen, they can pay for it. Um, you know, there's, there's other opportunities that they, that they may have. I mean, there's ARPA money. Um, I don't know, maybe there's, there's, there's all kinds of things that might happen. Is it critical that you give them 100000 Absolutely not. If you want to say, well, you know, come to us if you have a need, if you need a new Zamboni, uh, come to us and ask us for an appropriation. At that point, maybe the town will only volume loan fund. You can lend them money from the UDAD fund at 1% for 10 years to pay for the thing. The 100000 isn't critical, but I think it goes a long way to making them stable. What is critical for them right now is not having to pay that $2,300 a month debt. If they have to pay that well, anytime you? soon, they're going to end up having, they're going to end Here are the up keys. putting the keys on the table saying, we're done. So don't they already have issues with the water storage tank and that's they're already dealing with that. Oh, they are. How have they not been able to save money though? I don't get that. The rent has been in full operation since the fall. They've already been scheduling until late next summer. They, they, should, they have money coming in, so they should be able to have those saved up. I was going to ask the same too. Like where are revenues compared to 2019 right now? And are they quickly ramping up their reserves based on the return of revenues and still not having that debt service thing? I mean, I don't know. Be, there's got to be some scenario that that starts to happen. So I guess that's part of my reason for not wanting to have an in-depth conversation with them. Yeah, well, I'm not against having a conversation. It's, it's their, it's their, uh, I guess the ball's in their court. Katie, you've been you've been working with them. No, I haven't. Well, haven't. I know not recently, but you know, for a while you you were attending board meetings and stuff. I I know you didn't get all the information. You know, I know we've spoken, and you felt sometimes you may have not been getting all the information that you should have been getting. But what do you think right now is? From your knowledge, you know, you, you're involved with, you know, youth sports and stuff like that. What do you think is in, in their mindset, where they want to go with this? Are the board. To speak about that. Yeah. If, you, if you aren't, then don't. You don't have to, you know, comment if you don't want, but if you have an opinion, I, I would love to hear it. Now, I'm just curious if you have some sense from that board of where they want to go. I think they want to be able to turn a profit again. And we said, Everyone does. But honestly, that rink has been on the downhill slide for a very long time. Yeah. How so? Programming was, they have lost all their figure skating program. They used to have shows. They're not even able to schedule figure skating next year for ice time. Um, if there's hockey programming numbers are down. There's not enough people coming in the building. That's on them. Because if you talk to their board, they don't want to hear the word fun or anything. <coughs> and the way that they treat their employees is terrible. They haven't been able to be consistent in their employment or guarantee their um, employees hours. Since the pandemic started, and before, they have cut their employees' hours three different times. So, so the people that they employ don't know what work there. Bill, can I, can I say, so I, so I was also a liaison for a little bit. I was Bill's left-hand man for that, but uh, then the pandemic kept the ass getting way too busy to continue. But I attended probably a handful of meetings in the beginning and got the sense that things weren't panning out the way it, it wasn't as successful. I'm surprised to hear that they have been, and I believe you, I believe what you're saying. I'm just surprised to hear it because I was getting the sense too from their 
the board meetings that we were sitting in on that there were some some issues with generating revenue. And this was before it was right before COVID. So sorry, you're surprised to hear what? I'm uh, just surprised to hear, and I believe Bill, so I don't want, don't want to think I'm challenging on this, but I'm surprised to hear they're doing so well. They've been able to, I mean, the numbers make sense. I'm surprised that they have money in the bank. Right. I think they're making it all with Bill. So there may I, be some infusion of private money there as well. Well, so I, I was in you know, a handful of meetings. I identified right off the bat you know, six different ways that we could save money while taking it over because you know, Bill said, we're not doing that, but... I want you to listen in and see, just in case we do, is this something feasible the town could do? Um, and anything as big as our, our insurance policy, we would take over and save a ton of money. To as small as, you know, they were trying to buy like eight hundred dollars in jackets. When I when I go to my lifeguards and I get you know an order of fifty dollars, you know, so it's there was whether it's a management thing or whatnot, there was areas I found that we could save money. Now what Bill is doing, he's and he's made a great case for it is. You know, we're trying to give them this, right? The restructuring the debt, and if you couple the hundred thousand dollars, this gives it the most strong, strongest opportunity to then avoid having that headache in the future of the town taking it over. Uh, if that's, in a nutshell, what you're, what you're saying. That's, yeah. that's my stated goal. Is so that the, the community, and when I say the community, I mean the select board that I've worked with. There hasn't seemed to be any stomach on the board to want to operate and own and operate an ice center. So we have it in the community. I think it's an important asset for the community. And I'm just trying to do what I can to keep it viable in its current state. And kind of right now, and I, I hear you, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to telegraph a message that I'm saying $100,000 isn't a lot of money, it's a lot of money. But in the grand scheme of things, in terms of when you have an opportunity, when are we going to have an opportunity when we have, when we're going to have $1.5 million of federal money that has come in that we can use? When are we going to have an opportunity when we have the fund balance that we have this year? And you know what? I think if the ICE Center wanted to, they've, they've stuck with their commitment that they, they're not asking the town for anything. But I bet if they went out and got a petition and asked for $20,000 a year, like the Senior Citizen Center is asking for thirty two, dollars they'd probably be able to get that petition. They'd get $20,000 a year forever from now on. So, like, I think this is a, an easier way to do it. Uh, I'm not against talking to them. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk to them, just do this without even a conversation. But I think this is the time that you have the resources. You can provide the help that they need. It's, it's, it's a time when I think the stars will wind up and it can be done without pain. Anyway, it's awful late. Yeah, it and Harry's raising his hand. May I offer a comment? Um, th this is the topic that intrigued me to you know, uh, time you come out. Um, first, I read it in the wrong about, and I read the minutes from the meeting. Um, I know there's details with Dice Center, and you guys enlightened me on some of the things you're thinking about with that. I think the bigger picture that I want you to consider is really other things that Bill is trying to accomplish with um, the merger of the water sewer districts um, into the town. Uh, I think long term, um, the two governance structures with EFA and the town is always going to be cumbersome. And I commend Bill for thinking of bringing this forward this time. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think I totally uh, I think most of us are on board with the, the merger uh, too, because it would have happened when we voted on merger years ago, and it just kept. So if that would have happened, there's now an opportunity. I think the ice center just is part of this component, partially because of the debt that lives over in Eli, but also just a conversation surrounding, you know, their, how you know how we have, we're in the middle of budget season, trying to figure out if we're gonna 
where we've never historically put money into this, and I understand there's reasons why Fireville was when they originally, as far as I understand, built this, and they've held strong that they won't ask the town for money. Maybe that's why they haven't. You know, so I, I respect that. But I also, I think, I, to me, we have to completely separate the two conversations and make sure that that merger conversation is absolutely at the forefront and, and I believe should happen. At the same time, start working with the ice center as much as we can to help understand their needs and how we can help and wait for them to ask for specific amounts of money and then have that conversation. I, I, I think there's a risk there of getting too ahead of it where give them an opportunity they have 17 years or 15 years or if it's at 17 and it's 15 years of showing that they can't run in the black sounds like maybe they need some fresh young ideas or whatever to try to get back to either programming of the past or trying to figure out ways to grow their revenues back where they were historically but that to me is a completely separate conversation and I hate that it's even part of the conversation surrounding this merger of these two entities. Understood. Yeah. I mean, I thought that that was part of the original plan and, and forgive me if I was misunderstood, but so help me God, I didn't think that the sewer and water being merged into this whole part of it was even no, that's Consider. absolutely, that's the, that's the main goal. And, and he's yeah. right. We, you know, the ice center is it's a separate yeah, part. It's a consideration, but it's not our well, main when, focus. When you right merge, now. you will you will now hold that debt. So it is part of the conversation, but it sounds like they're actively working and restructuring debt, and there there are things in motion. I think. Very quickly, we should have a conversation with them, whether it's a couple of us to just do a follow-up to our other meeting that we have with them, and just talk about what we talked about tonight and really get a sense for where they are at. So yeah. the other part is the volunteerism down there. You know, is it a stable volunteerism? Is it on the cusp of just the house of cards collapsing? Um, you know, there's a lot of things to consider in this whole picture. Of the ice center. Um, and well, that, why, that, why should Waterbury be the only town to throw hundred thousand dollars in if it if you know so many members from other communities are, are using that building as well or using that facility in that? You know, that's the other thing that comes to mind thinking about this. But well, I think it's so we don't have to in the future take it over and, and potentially have a right. that cost so going we, forward long talk, term. The, I got 30 seconds and then we should all go home. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's late. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about the financial risks and stuff like that. The, the real risk, frankly, and you, you can say all you want, Katie, and maybe it's a self fulfilling prophecy, but the, the people that run the ice center, you know, they're all my age or older. You know, Jonathan's in his 70s, and they've been doing this for a long time. There's nobody stepping up saying, oh, we want to be on, we want to manage the ice net. We want to run the board. You know, I don't, so that's the other side of the equation is that, uh, you know, who's going to step up? Are you going to step up and do what those four people do uh, when, when they're, you know, either dead or, you know, in a nursing home? I don't. I don't know who's going to be doing it. That's the other. That's why I asked. That's now that I think that's another risk, right? So the, well, yeah. exactly. And you know, I mean, if I had to tell you right now, is the ice center in its current business model good for another 20 years? Probably not, uh, unless some younger people start stepping up, saying, you know, we'll put in our time like you guys have. For the last 17 years. Yeah, but that, you know, that, that aspect is, is disappearing everywhere. I understand. You know, it's just all nonprofits, they're all having problems recruiting people. It's just, it's terrible. Anyway, thank you all. Uh, thank you. The last thing um, you Danny uh, had to go earlier. She texted me to yeah. apologize that she's not feeling great for like what she talked about. Thanks for coming by, Harry. Yeah.
I just wrote a book with it. There's a lot in it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, meeting with the other set of people, you can go. Come.